iconic. Well, it's so iconic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, between the signs out front, uh, the big tower sign out front, and, and this, uh, it, it will just Yeah. Yeah, we just got to We just got to find.
Sorry. Tom is wondering. Oh, I got one. Idea. Just slide down. Did you get it? I just wanted to have a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yes, it is. It's your imaginary friend. Yeah. Keep talking. Yeah. When you answer them, let me know. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Scarborough Downs workshop. Uh, uh, we have the Scarborough Downs team here, uh, as well as the town council and administrative staff. And I'm going to ask uh, town manager Tom Hall to kick it off. Great. Um, staff just has a few introductory <coughs> comments, really kind of set the stage, if you will, and then the balance of the evening is really up to uh, Rocky and his team um, to take us through, and I think there will be ample time for discussion, which uh, I think is something they really want to uh, make sure we have time for. Um, just first and foremost, this uh, was arranged to be, uh, I think, on January 7th. It was early January, and at our request to accommodate the council schedule, we asked for this to be delayed. So just want the record to show that uh, these folks have been interested in, in sitting down with council for some time now, so I'm, I'm glad we're finally able to get together. And really, for the council's purpose, there's no action asked of you tonight, and in fact, it'll be interesting to see as this process unfolds in terms of what action the council uh, will have. Um, I think there might be some foreshadowing tonight in terms of zone considerations, uh, potential future partnerships, all of those sorts of things will kind of develop and unfold over time. Uh, but in the near term, there's really kind of no action in front of council. Uh, the planning board has kind of the initial heavy lifting with uh, looking at the infrastructure plan and then next with the master plan. Um, and I guess the final piece I just mentioned, and it remains to be seen whether it's an issue that we want to talk about, is kind of community connectivity. Uh, this site is, um, among other things, one of its attributes is proximity to Oak Hill and to this campus. And uh, right now there's some challenges in the zoning ordinance in terms of connectivity between here and there. And so those are issues that the, if the town thinks that's important, we'll have to dig into that. Um, I don't believe that they're planning on that uh, as part of their initial master plan. <coughs> but if that's something we think is important, that's probably uh, some effort that we'll have to put forward. So that's kind of the, the background. I'll ask Jay and Karen just to fill in a couple gaps, and then we'll get right into it. Sure. Uh, thank everybody for coming tonight. So we wanted to, to start with uh, an excerpt straight from the zoning ordinance that really sets the stage for what this zone was intended to be. And I think it really begins to identify some of those things that are both land use oriented but really go beyond the borders in many respects. And one of the things that the uh, zone purpose really talks about is you know, this is going to be a vibrant center in the heart of Scarborough. That's in the zoning ordinance. It's intended to be some a piece of property that would work cooperatively. And that's um, really why we've been talking about Scarborough Downs as being a partnership. Um, you know, it's a partnership with a small P right now where we're discussing and talking about things that can happen, but as Tom um, alluded to, there may be partnerships that go beyond the small P, you know, whether or not there's TIFs or other types of public purpose um, requests either on our side or on their side. And it really is um, a, a unique opportunity. We keep saying that, but I want to continue to emphasize that, and I think Jay feels strongly as well as we look at this. So few times does a property like this come before um, a town <coughs> and present the opportunities that it does. And so I do think the zone purpose in the, zo in the zoning ordinance lays out um, a great foundation for working cooperatively and for really designing something new, uh, perhaps unconventional and, and really exciting for the town. And then Jay is going to walk you through just a little bit of what the planning board's job <coughs> is, because there's some uh, they've got a lot of work to do as well. Sure. So just briefly, and Tom already alluded to some of it, um, as we're having these discussions with the council, the uh, team has also been before the planning board to start the sort of regulatory review process. The crossroads. Uh, Plan Development District really lays out sort of a, a stepped and measured approach to the review process. And the first bit of that, um, the planning board conducted in early January, was 
identifying a conceptual infrastructure plan. When the zoning was crafted, it was recognized, obviously, that this is a, a, a significant piece of land in the middle of town. We want to be sure before pieces or pods of this uh, property started to be developed that there was sort of an overall plan that would demonstrate how the parcel would tie into the infrastructure, as the name would uh, identify. The next steps in the process are coming up with uh, master plans for the uh, various pods of development. <coughs> that's 500 acres, um, of which you know some number, two to 300, is developable. Um, so there's going to be a bit of time from you know the time um, uh, the project develops over. So uh, enabling sort of master plans of you know 50 acre pods or so to, to come through the process, and that's really where the planning board is at the next stage. The, um, they'll be coming forward with a, a master plan for the first phase of development. And then um, once that master plan is established, then the board gets into the sort of formal site plan subdivision process where they really dive into the, the weeds of stormwater and, and traffic counts and lighting and architecture and all those sort of finite items. So. Um, just want to sort of set the stage with the council on that to let you know that that is ongoing um, and will be going on for some time. So with that, I think we'll toss it over to Rocky. Yeah, I just have oh, a big question. Yeah, sorry, just a, question. just a quick question. Uh, Jay, yeah. where, uh, what's the council involvement through any of that? Are there any approval requirements through any of that process? So at this point, there there isn't um, through the planning board review process. If there, and I think Tom already uh, touched on a few, you, you know, there may be adjustments to the zoning that are sought um, as development um, comes along and, and other opportunities. But um, at this point, um, the planning board has the, the ordinance is in place, and the board has uh, the review authority, um, provided they meet all those standards and regulations. So, master plan doesn't have to be finalized or approved through us. That's all through planning That's process. That's all through planning board. Okay. Correct. Okay. Sorry, Tom. Oh, with that, I was going to flip it over to Rocky. He's going to introduce the okay. team, and we'll jump right into it. <clears throat> well, great. Thank you so much uh, for for being here tonight. Uh, it took a little while to get here, but but, but we're all here, and we think that uh, we can really, uh, to use one of Peter's terms, make some eggs tonight. And uh, and plow some ground. Uh, I did want to just introduce the team. I think uh, at this point, probably everybody at the table knows that, that we have purchased the property. We do own it. Uh, that, that piece of uh, the puzzle has been, been put in place. Uh, but the ownership team is Crossroads, uh, Crossroads Development LLC. Uh, that consists of my two brothers, uh, Bill and Mark, and myself, and uh, Peter and Dick Mishu, uh, who are also brothers. And uh, we've done quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of work together over the years. So. Uh, we're really excited uh, to, to have been able to purchase this property. Um, the development team uh, includes us as, as developers, of course, and we're um, we're not like every developer around. We're really hands-on and uh, always have been. It's hard for us not to be. So we're we're all taking quite an interest in this in this project and uh, probably giving Dan a little more direction than he really wants. But. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we have Dan Bacon here uh, with us tonight. Goro Palmer uh, has been selected as our engineers. They're going to do all of our planning and engineering, traffic engineering, that sort of thing. Dan has that team. We've got uh, uh, landscape architecture, which is a big key to this, this whole project. Uh, Nick Aceto uh, and his wife, Caitlin, have a small firm in Portland, and, and we're very happy that they're working for us, and I think they've turned out some, some really good work, and we look forward to continuing with that. Um, we've got Jim Demesis with Camoyne Associates is doing uh, market study work for us. Uh, you know, I think you're all familiar with Jim. He's, he lives here in town, uh, has worked all over the country, and uh, really gets uh, the numbers and, and is uh, providing us with some great, great information. So he's here with us tonight. Um, uh, Diana Nelson with Blackfly Media is also working with us handling our public relations. Uh, she's, she's not here, but she's working with us on uh, on the press and, and handling that. And uh, on the real estate marketing end, Drew Sigfordson over at uh, Bullis Company is, is handling the, uh, the marketing for us. So that's our team. Um, both Dan and Jim have uh, some presentations that we, we want to give to you tonight. Uh, we've got this laid out. We're going to try to get through it as quickly as we can. What we were hoping for is to really have some time to spend on some back and forth and questions and, and talking about things. But I think if you would allow us to give you the, give you our presentation, maybe hold the questions if we can, and uh, let them let them show you what we're thinking. 
and, uh, and then let's let's get into some questions and, and really talk about this thing. So if that's acceptable. You ready? Great, right, Dan. Uh, thanks, Rocky. Uh, it's great to be back uh, to see you all and. I'll be working with the council again in a slightly different way, uh, but I think an equally exciting way. This is an honor to be working on this project and working with this team on such a special property with such significance to, uh, to the community. So uh, thanks again. And as Rocky said, uh, we want to spend only half or less of tonight's workshop um, with our presentation and save uh, as much as much time for conversation. We can go back through the slides and, and cover ground that, that I try to work through um, with the initial presentation. Um, but we do have a fair amount we want to get through. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. Uh, in terms of workshop objectives, <coughs> we want to you know, introduce our initial vision, initial master plan for uh, the entire property of Scarborough Downs, uh, recognizing that it's going to be very much a phased, incremental, incremental process to build out. We want to talk a little bit about the design goals and equally important, the, the market demand for the type of community and development that, that we're thinking about. Um, we also want to, and Jim's going to speak to this more than I, but, but public and private ROI, return on investment, is a key component to this project um, to be successful. Um, to get past phase one, it has to have a positive ROI um, for the developers, but just as importantly, we're thinking about this in terms of the public return on investment. And what is the right development mix to, to be successful for the community? Um, and, and very much related to that is the partnership, as, as Karen introduced. Um, it's part of the zoning, is that um, this, this parcel and this zoning is to be a partnership through deciding on what the right land use mix and development mix, but also on um, other partnerships that we'll talk about this evening in terms of maybe some community benefits um, as well as uh, financial partnerships on various aspects. And as I think Karen and Jay touched on earlier, um, the zoning we think is 90% there, um, but as we're looking at what what the market demand is, um, digging into the zoning district details, you know, we'd, we'd like to introduce some ideas from some zoning amendments. They're not dramatic, um, but we think they, they fit the site, and we'd like to get some initial reactions from the council on, on some zoning amendments. Um, and as importantly as, as, as these items, we want to get your thoughts and, and start the conversation around this, this project um, and talk about what the next steps are. Um, not that this group doesn't know where the Downs is, um, but we want to just show this map that, that highlights the significance of the property to the community. You know, it's in the geographic center of town. It's maybe you know, a quarter of a mile north of the geographic center, but it's more or less in, in the heart of the community um, in a very central location. It's 500 acres. Um, we're learning the, nut, the sort of the nooks and crannies and, and how many acres it is. I'm not sure we know exactly, but we know that it's at least 500 acres. Um, it's very accessible. It's right off the, the interchange. It's right by Oak Hill. Um, it's a, adjacent to a lot of different things. Um, even though it's accessible, it's actually hard to get to the center. It's not like it's right on major routes. Um, Nick has been working hard on the design and um, I'm being really thoughtful in terms of kind of laying out development potential and, and we're using kind of walkability as an important metric with the project. Um, and so the circles that are on this plan show 5, 10, 15 minute walks. So again, in terms of adjacency, um, the Downs is walkable to Oak Hill. It just right now, the infrastructure isn't there to be walkable. It's walkable to a lot of other things along Route 1 and I guess Parkway. Uh, infrastructure costs are going to be significant for this project. Um, and that's part of the, the puzzle with this project in terms of partnerships and, and, and ROI. But they're also, uh, we see as an incredible opportunity for not just the project, but the community. There can be some great infrastructure improvements made as part of a project that benefit much more than just the, the, the development. And zooming even further out, we see this par parcel as really a community building opportunity that, um, that doesn't come around every, every day or every year or every decade. 
and to every community. So um, I think it's pretty exciting. So as before we kind of get into details of the downs uh, in Scarborough, we laid it on a few places that people uh, may be familiar with um, to get a sense of scale, which we thought was important to do. Um, so the, the map or the plan on the left is actually um, downtown Newport <coughs> and its surroundings. And um, so the, the white roofs and kind of the core of, of downtown Freeport, that's L.O. Bean and uh, the central kind of Main Street shopping area. And you'll, might not be the easiest thing to see from your seats, but you'll probably can see that that's really only, for a 500 acre parcel, that's maybe a fifth of the size of Scarborough Downs. And then you also can see kind of Route 1 going north and south and neighborhoods, et cetera. So to get a sense of scale, Downtown Freeport and a lot of the surroundings can fit into the boundaries of Scarborough Downs. Um, the, the middle image is Mashpee Commons in Cape Cod, and that's not right around the corner, so you might say, why, why do we care about Mashpee Commons? Uh, Mashpee Commons, we've been thinking about and looking at as a model <coughs> to a degree for aspects of this project. Mashpee Commons has sort of a, a more contemporary downtown that was created. Um, <coughs> And that's the kind of cluster of development right in the center. And that takes up about a tenth of the, the, the property. So you know, Karen introduced the idea of a kind of a vibrant, mixed use, maybe downtown potential. We share that vision. And, and we think that that can happen. We also think other things can happen on the parcel that, that relate well to that. And then the third image is uh, the Portland Peninsula. And um, so Scarborough Downs would take up maybe two thirds of the Portland Peninsula. So um, and it kind of gives you a good sense for the wide mix of things that you all know are happening on the Portland Peninsula from the East End residential area down to Congress Street and, and Forest Street down to Bayside. So you know, it's we thought this was kind of fun and interesting <coughs> to, to kind of put it in perspective as to what's possible on the Downs and what the mix could be and um, some other communities. So as, as Karen and Jay introduced, um, Scarborough has been working on ideas for the Downs for quite some time, um, going back to the Comprehensive Plan 2006, and there's been a lot of discussion recently uh, in the Comprehensive Plan that you're working on about the significance of the property as a regional activity center um, and having zoning that can enable that and, and having a development project that can enable that. So we've been thinking a lot about how can our plans implement uh, the town's goals through both comprehensive plans as that regional activity center. A few of the kind of bullets and, and ideas that we've taken from the recent comp plan process and some of the images and the visions that the communities come up with are, are shown here. Um, you know, one big idea that we heard was take control of downs and, and um, you know, I think sure, that's, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're sitting here today. You know, what, what does that mean? And, and how can we work together to kind of control the right future for the Downs? So um, there is local control for this parcel as, as brought up in the comp plan. And uh, we're excited to be working with you, starting to work with you on that. Street connectivity, walkability. You know, creating good transportation networks it seems to be a theme in the comp plan and, and for good reasons. Um, and that's a theme in the design of this project and that you'll see in, in a few minutes. Um, housing for all came up in the comp plan process and, and we know that having a mix of housing is, is a key goal that the town's been working on for years. Um, and, and we see that being real possibility in this project and, and having that a wide range of housing opportunities and, and mix. Opportunities for community center um, has been brought up, not necessarily just for the downs or, but, but the Oak Hill area, you know, is it, is it in this area? Um, and we'll talk about it a bit later, but recreation is, is a really intriguing focal point for our team and for this property. Um, so there, there could be some opportunities for a community center to be a component of that or components of what people desire from a community center. 
um, could be incorporated <coughs> in this project. So we see some real, real excitement around that and opportunity. And and having a mixed use activity center. You know, Karen introduced that's really what the zoning talks about. So and and that's what we've been taking cues from. So this is a, a quick slide that walks through at a high level what the, the current zoning is all about. It's um, it's unique to the Downs, just given how big the Downs is and that it's in common ownership. So it's a zone designed for the property. It allows a really wide range of uses and development types, um, from commercial all the way through residential and kind of civic type uses. Um, it expects a balance of development, not all commercial, not all residential, but a good mix that can feed off each other um, and provide that diversity. And it, it expects um, a mix of housing and it requires affordable housing. That's, that's the only zone in the community that requires at least 10% of the housing to be affordable for <coughs> the town's definition requirements. I mentioned an activity center and kind of walkability, but the zoning calls for those things. It also expects a fair amount of open space, so it's not anticipating the entire parcel be developed. It, it re requires 20% to be open, um, and, and to have it open space designed in a, in a logical way, in a connected way that um, conserves wetlands and, and streams and, and benefits the project. It also has a lot of flexibility. You know, didn't want to establish a specific um, you know, lot size requirements or specific design requirements recognizing the other uh, goals for the development. So. At each stage in the process, we would work with the planning board on setting what are the right um, development standards for in a pod or area of the project. And as Jay introduced, um, it requires master planning up front. So it needs to be, you need to show the planning board how things are going to be de developed over time, and then you can implement those um, piece by piece. <coughs> and I think Karen already touched on the collaboration and kind of the partnership piece of the zone. So in line with the zoning, um, our team has been working really hard on designing in a, in a consistent way. We envision that kind of mixed-use, livable community center could happen on this project over time. Um, we've been, Nick in particular, and our team have been thinking a lot about kind of the walkability, bikeable, kind of complete streets approach with this project. Um, and the connections and integration both within the project from one area to the other, but also its connections and integration <coughs> to what's around the property. Oak Hill to Higgins Parkway, to the different activities that, and development that are happening around the downs. Um, you know, a project like this we see being a great opportunity to provide housing for really all generations that need it. Um, there's demand and Jim will talk about this further for millennial housing that, that want space in the suburbs, that don't all want to live, um, say, on the peninsula in Portland, like I showed earlier, all the way up through kind of retiree and senior housing. So we see there's an opportunity for a wide housing mix. And as I mentioned earlier, we see recreation being a real focal point and catalyst that could, that could um, propel the project and be be a fixture in the project. You know, that could be continuation of the track for a period of time or or longer, or and it could be a pivot to other additional kind of recreation entertainment type uses that um, may have come along soon. We also see the, the property providing a pretty diverse commercial base, um, tax base and, and be an economic <coughs> engine for the community. I mentioned ROI and fiscal sustainability. Um, but that's, that's Jim will touch on it, but that's uh, an underpinning that's critical for the project's success. Open space and greenways, as you see uh, in this master plan, there's a lot of green that some of it's wetlands, some of it's active green space um, and trails and linkages between different development areas. Um, as mentioned, you know, the and I'll touch on a little bit further. You see the core, this, the central part of the downtown, <coughs> ultimately being maybe a downtown or a mixed-use center. We have 
that in mind, but that'll take time to kind of work towards that core. Um, and that's, I guess, the last bullet here is time. <laughs> this is a significant parcel of 500 acres. Um, so this, there's, there's going to be some short-term goals in terms of development. There's going to be mid-term goals, and there's going to be you know, long-term build-out. It's, it's going to be a 20 to 40-year time frame. Know, as this evolves. So in, in this, this team has that kind of long range commitment and vision. So to break it down a little bit further, just to give you a flavor for the areas that we're currently thinking uh, of the parcel in that master plan, um, and also some sense for kind of phasing what could come early, what, what will be later. The southern lead area, the area closest to Route 1, um, we've already started some conceptual designs for this really being kind of a residential area, where it's a mix of residential, um, from kind of multifamily type housing to, to duplex to um, kind of empty nester style housing, you know, single living, single story living to single family housing. Um, I think this is a good place for it. It's adjacent to residential on Sawyer Road. Um, it's close to Oak Hill. And we're designing it, kind of hitting the goals that I mentioned earlier. You know, designing in a walkable way, in an integrated way. Um, Nick's <coughs> come up with some creative ideas with common space and open space. You know, uh, having houses front greens and, and be fairly compact, but really livable. So it's a, and these are some examples of the type of housing that could be integrated here. Um, and we'll come back to you in the planning board with more details. Um, part of the reason, too, is that we see there's market demand for this mix of housing in the short term. Um, and housing is critical to propelling commercial at later stages. So um, we need to have some rooftops, too, to enable to implement a, a mixed-use center or commercial uh, in the core of the property. Now I've jumped all the way up to the northern edge, just to keep you on your toes. So this is the area along Payne Road. Um, and this is an area that we kind of see as the opposite of the Route 1 end. Uh, we see this as more of a commercial, industrial, kind of logistical end of the property. It's close to the highway. It's close to some industrial and commercial activity on Payne Road. Um, it's accessible. And uh, we think it's, it's an area that can be integrated but separated, where it's connected to the rest of the project, but it can be buffered and, and it can be, um, have its own character. And so this is one, an area that we want to talk later in the presentation about some potential zoning amendments. Right now, the zone allows a wide range of commercial, but not uh, various industrial uses. And, and we see... And, and Drew and others working with us on the, on the market broker side, including Jim, see there's high demand for manufacturing, high demand for flex industrial space, um, <coughs> space for, for tech type uses. Um, so, and out of the, the areas of the, of the property, we see this as a, an ideal location for that. Um, and with those land uses comes good employment, comes you know, if it's, if it's more compact, real positive return on investment in terms of development. Um, so that's currently the, the ideas and vision for this aspect of the property. So in terms of the, we're jumping now into kind of more of the central part of the property uh, around the track. And this is an area that it's gonna take some time. Um, these other few areas need to occur first. Uh, most likely, but we see this as a, a great opportunity for kind of that vibrant, mixed-use, um, town center type area. Uh, and in the shorter term, we see recreation and ent entertainment being early catalysts <coughs> for that type of development. You know, is it a private recreation outfit that has, um, you know, sports that, that the such as soccer, hockey, other sports that want a private facility um, in close proximity to the schools, close, close proximity to the, to the town center. 
Um, we also see opportunities around, you know, if the track doesn't continue <coughs> operating after two, four, five, six years, what is the retrofit opportunities? What is what does the track become? Um, and that's been a real kind of design challenge for us in a good and bad way. You know, one day we're kind of designing around the track and it's the focal point of the project. The next day we're like, why are we designing around the track if we don't know the future? Um, but it, we see it as, you know, really it's a landmark building. The grandstands is a landmark building. The track is, is obviously a fixture for the past 60 or more years. So we've been taking cues from it um, and think that regardless of its future, um, there could be those could be landmarks that really define the project. Um, so we keep on looking at that, um, and if the track does change over time, um, we're thinking about how do we design in a way that that recognizes that history. Um, just moving up slightly, um, this is an area just north of the track where. <coughs> You know, Nick's laid out with our with our input. You know, a real opportunity for that kind of town square environment, um, <clears throat> that kind of Mashpee Commons or that um, that Freeport Main, where it's not necessarily retail or, or all retail, given where retail is at, but it's but it's a mix um, with a catalyst like recreation, entertainment. You know, this could be a mix of retail, office, housing, hospitality, a wide range of kind of commercial uses with residential uh, around it, as well as some more kind of um, conventional uh, commercial. There could be a grocery and kind of shopping center nearby. There could be other, an office uh, campus, you know, that we think will likely want to locate here if it's strong in amenities and it's strong in kind of sense of place and community. And Jim will talk more about that. Um, so these are some rough ideas as to how to kind of get at that town center goal and be that, that vibrant, special place in the heart of the community. And another kind of component of the project, more kind of northern easterly, so this is just north of the track where the, the stables are today um, and southeast of the Payne Road area, we see this area uh, as <coughs> another kind of residential, a uh, larger residential area. That, that could include a wide range of residential, uh, like that first pod, where it could be kind of senior type housing all the way down to, to apartments and millennial type housing um, or you know, young professionals as well as single family. Um, we see single family neighborhood opportunities. We've also talked about kind of assisted living and, and that type of uh, component in this area as well. And again, the layout is grid, it's compact, it's walkable, and it's, it's by design. It's what the zoning is asking for, and, it, and we think it's, it's what the market is asking for um, in, a, in a place like Scarborough. A place like Scarborough, this is the a term we learned a few weeks ago. Um, I don't know if we're going to stick with it for too long, but it instills sort of the, the idea of the project. Um, at the Merida, the, the real estate uh, conference a few weeks ago, the, the term serving came up um, as really, a, really that's the very hot and desirable kind of development pattern or, or kind of market, development market right now nationally um, and you know Maine is always a couple years behind so maybe this is the first Serban uh, project in, in southern Maine of scale um, but Serban is intended to mean a suburban location but with urban amenities so it's it's sort of urban light um, where you know it's more suburban housing but you're walking to maybe to work maybe to a coffee certainly a coffee shop to to a restaurant, to entertainment. In some areas, maybe it's just a residential neighborhood, other areas it's mixed use. Um, and these are some images that are kind of part of our early considerations in terms of different development types and, and, and designs where you know there could be that kind of grocery anchor, but it's walkable to your house. There's that uh, shops on the first floor office or housing upstairs. There's um, townhouses, there's 
single family houses, but they're pretty pretty clustered and they have green space right out the front door. So um, that's we're taking a lot of design cues um, from this term term suburban, um, but we think it's it really helps define what the zoning is is talking about and what the town's okay. visions have been. Did as a day, which is all okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Diana. There you go, All right, so this is the handoff to market context. I've shown you what the planners think. Let's see how it fits into the market. <laughs> Got a lot of experience working with those planners. <laughs> it's all good. Um, so um, thanks, Dan. And I'm going to walk through this, and then obviously I'm going to try to get through it quick so we can handle some questions too. So um, I want to. Um, we're in the middle of doing market analysis, um, and it's not complete. It's sort of evolving. Uh, but I'm going to share with you some early findings tonight that are sort of uh, based both on what we know through the work that we've done here, but also from our experience in the region and so forth, working with other communities, other developers, and businesses. So, and again, some of this is going to be stuff that you already know, but we're seeing uh, really strong demand for residential. Um, when you're dealing with mixed use types of development, be they buildings or be they larger sites um, in separate parcels, residential is leading the market. So it's typical that not just here in southern Maine, but also throughout New England uh, and the Northeast, when um, when mixed use are proposed, the early phases absolutely include rooftops to be able to support later phases of development. Uh, there is a very soft demand for commercial office. And again, there's anecdotes there. People move around the region. They choose to move from one town to another for various regions, reasons when their leases are up or if they're expanding. But when you look at the demand overall, um, it's uh, soft for a commercial office, although uh, we separate out, it's uh, much stronger for medical office. And, and again, look around Scarborough, Greater Portland, you can see the medical office has, has flourished. Um, the demand, there is, there is a demand for light manufacturing, manufacturing, uh, light industrial, if you will. Uh, this tends to be not mega manufacturing facilities, but smaller, uh, oftentimes flex. Uh, in fact, these are some of the lowest um, vacancy rates we've seen in a very long time. I think they've been, uh, Portland was reporting like a 1.5 uh, vacancy rate for, for light industrial. Um, and we're, we're experiencing that here in Scarborough and the surrounding communities as well. Um, with um, Scarborough, based on the demographics, and this, this is all part of your planning as well that you've done here in the town, but in terms of when we look at it, it's, it's not one group. It's not just, oh boy, Scarborough's aging, but no young people are coming in. It's mixed multiple mar market segments. An aging population and senior that has certain market basket of goods or demands, if you will. And then there's also young families, workforce that's here because of the amount of jobs that we have here in the, and in the region. Um, and then we also get a lot of independent contractors, telecommuters, those type, like myself, who live here but work wherever. Um, and that creates a demand for both different kinds of housing, but also different kinds of business services and things like that. Uh, Dan already hit on this, so I won't dwell on it too much, but um, this relates to that um, Serban, um, <laughs> which is a term I think that recently came out of the Merida Conference, the Maine Real Estate um, Development Association. But um, we're seeing a shift in the market. This is local, but it's also national here. So um, we always think about this in terms of urban areas, but it's uh, towards mixed uses, high amenities, quality designed, pedestrian friendly, transportation <coughs> options, and connected, and it's not just in the urban areas. Think about it this way. People talk about, like, in a different perspective, they'll say, oh, um, boy, the millennials are demanding different things than the, the, than the boomers and the Gen Xs. And that's true, they do. But over time, they actually influence the market so that people in those other generation categories start to want some of the same things. So it's not distinct. It starts to influence the market, if you will. Uh, there is strong competition uh, in surrounding communities. Um, all the communities, in fact, all of the Northeast would love to have this opportunity. So um, 
when you're looking at um, co like competition in the sense of where dollars can flow, where development can occur, um, you have to take into account that competition and it must create something that's unique in the market. In other words, what can we do here that's bigger than just the sum of its parts of houses and businesses and open space? Collectively, can it be unique in the market? So what's going to make it successful? Um, um, there's uh, several factors that I just want to lay out there as a framework. It's got to be, um, and I'm not going to dwell on them because Dan's already hit on a bunch, but it's got to be well planned, it's got to be mixed use, and it's got to be grounded in both market realities, so based on current and recent market, but also market potential. And that's where we talk about, whereas Dan was talking about different phases or different components of the property, they have, in a sense, their own, if you will, microeconomy around them or micro market factors. But then when you add them together and you start interplaying between them, they're also going to create some other kinds of market demand, market dynamics. So that's what I mean by market potential. And it, because it's long term as well, it's gets difficult, obviously, us people in the market analysis and econ uh, economy world and doing forecasting, the further you go out, the less accurate we are, and you have to take that into account and be adaptable as well, and I think Dan was using the word flexible. Um, rooftops are critical um, when you're talking about, um, obviously, when you're talking about retail, it's critical, but in terms of creating a talent workforce base, it's also critical as well. So residential, um, in order to get the sort of, um, sort of um, thrust that you need, um, you're going to have to take advantage of some of the early on market uh, strengths, the light industrial or the light manufacturing, the, roof, the rooftops. Uh, you're likely, based on just the sheer size alone, going to have to attract and sustain some anchors. Those anchors might be some retail, and again, I wouldn't be going out making this an entire anchor retail play because we know that retail overall is reducing its square footage and there's an oversupply in the market nationally. But again, in this kind of business where there's going to be, or this kind of site where there's going to be rooftops and a mix, anchors are going to want to be here as well. And a certain amount of that's going to be needed. And that's going to help you then, therefore, support the market for <coughs> local retail, which is very difficult. It's, it's, it's easy to start up local retail. It's very difficult to stay in business. You need mixed use. You need workers coming in. You need people at nighttime during, and then workers during the daytime. But whether that's retail, restaurants, hotels would be another example. Hotels would l unlikely to be the first in or early into this kind of development. But once you start adding the other factors, all of a sudden the hotel market looks a lot more appealing. Um, so again, it's got to be uh, creating an offering in the market that is new in the suburban market and can be competitive. Those, oh, and again, those are the kinds of things Dan's already mentioned, connections, flows, walkable, amenities, supporting infrastructure. That includes roads, but that also probably includes looking at things like broadband, looking at things like energy and those kinds of things as well. Um, and then it's mixed, but it's also supporting and, and creating some synergies. Um, it's got to fit with the community character, and I have a, we have a summary slide later that shows these sort of what, the importance of the community character along with the market, but it's important that that happens, and it's got to fit with the comp plan. It's got to be financially feasible, and that's including on both the public side and the private side. If this doesn't work for the public, it's not going to work well for the private and vice versa. So it's got to be something that, that it, it makes sense in terms of revenues and costs for the town and revenues and costs for the developer, the businesses, and so forth. And then finally, if it's done right and you can get those synergies, what you want to do is create other opportunities elsewhere in Scarborough. In other words, it's not going to be successful if we just create this beautiful development and Scarborough businesses move to here and leave other places vacant. Um, you want this to be helping here, which then creates more app options elsewhere in the community as well. Um, I think I'm going to skip some. There we go. 
We, uh, just real quickly on some of these next slides, I just want to let you know what we're doing as part of this and the kind of data that we're looking at. So right now, we're looking pretty much everything's on the table, commercial office, retail, so on and so forth. Some of the things I didn't hit on tonight were um, yet were like recreation. Um, in mixed use areas, the, uh, there's a high demand for different kinds of recreation. That's not just outdoor recreation. It could be things like, and you're already seeing them here in Scarborough, but rock gyms, uh, go-karting. Um, it could be uh, cinemas, those kind, a whole variety of things that when you look at retail potential, you're blending restaurant, retail, and entertainment. Um, the kinds of stuff that we're looking at in terms of data is regional and national real estate, but also local. Sedco and Karen has been great so far helping us with some of those economic trends. Um, and Jay as well in terms of development in the pipeline. Um, we've done interviews and we'll continue to do interviews with real estate and market experts. Um, we already heard about Mashby Commons, but we're going to continue to look at examples elsewhere of what kind of development has occurred. Sometimes those are going to be half are going to have to be outside of Maine because this is fairly unique. There isn't something I can point to you in Maine that says, oh boy, here's 500 acres that was developed very quickly, other than like an Air Force Base or Brunswick, which is very different in terms of the assets in the market, um, and then also just based on national experience. Um, the demand-driven approach, so that's going to be, um, let me just summarize uh, because we've already hit It's on this, it's got to be overlaying market analysis with master planning. In other words, it's, uh, both factors are very important. Um, it's going to be considered short term as, long as, long, as well as long term and in phases. Um, there's very few uses other than possibly an Amazon or something like that, which you know that would come in and create this kind of development instantly. Um, and then again, it's got to be greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so back to some of the components just graphically of a successful project. And this is a slide I use all the time in my work. Um, in terms of what makes something work. It's got to have local support and a partner. Um, you got to be, we're off to a good start, start with that. You have local players here. Um, it's got to have a commitment to design and vision. So it's got to be appealing. It's got to have flows. There's got to be market demand. It's got to make sense based on the economic trends in terms of retail versus commercial, how much of that, that kind of thing. And then finally, Different than market is the financial feasibility, the bottom line. You know, for you, for the municipality, that's going to be the cost of services versus the new revenues coming in, and so on and so forth. And then for the, um, it's got to make sense to the private sector pro forma as well, the costs um, and the benefits. So with all that said, uh, and this being a very significant project, um, it's not going to be, hey, what's the developer doing? It's going to require active participation, like we're doing tonight. It starts with discussions. You have a process already set up in terms of the planning process. But it's going to be critical that this be considered both from a public and a private perspective in order to achieve those success factors that I've already mentioned. Um, this is going to be including things like the different kinds of amenities, the infrastructure, the civic space in order to achieve open space, recreation fields, a community center. I'm just throwing those out as hypotheticals. But in order to achieve those things, you're going to need a public-private partnership to make that happen or multiple ways of doing public-private partnerships. The other reason that's going to be critical is because the town in its goals desires some diversity in terms of the economic base. And you want to be able to work with the developer um, and the team to be able to say, hey, listen, we don't want all of one type of development because that way it's not resilient to economic changes. So, but, but however, the market realities is that certain, part, certain kinds of development are more profitable than others. So in order to achieve a desired mix, you're going to, uh, a public-private partnership could really go a long way towards helping that. Otherwise, you tend to overbuild what's hot in the market in the short and the medium term. 
Um, and then again, it's got to be a win-win for the ROI. So things like tax increment financing, for instance, can be used um, in Scarborough, both in terms of helping out with the way the funding formula for the county tax and revenue sharing is to help avoid some of the negative impacts to the community. But they can also be used to help pay for some of the infrastructure site improvements and to support different kinds of uses to be paid for by the developer. And then it's got to be, um, all of this has to be um, so that it's, it's, it's competitive in the, in the regional marketplace. Dan, I think it's back to you now, and then we'll take questions. Thanks, Thanks Jim. I'm yeah. going to be efficient, because I know I'm being watched by a clock man. <laughs> um, as alluded to a little bit earlier, there's some initial zoning tweaks, we're calling them, um, and adjustments that we'd like to, to start a conversation on. Um, one of them is, is a map, is a map issue or a map amendment. Um, when, when the team uh, acquired the property, discovered that the boundaries aren't what the assessor thought they were. Um, and the, or the property owner for that matter. But uh, the zoning map, um, when it, was, when it re was rezoned to crossroads, it followed the assessor's um, parcel lines. And it might be hard to see from your seats, but in yellow is uh, what the survey plan shows is the property boundary, um, and in red is is the zone is the zoning district. So there's a pretty good size parcel of approximately 30 acres here that um, wasn't thought to be part of the the overall property, um, and it's therefore not zoned crossroads. It's zoned a village residential four and then maybe partially RF, rural farm. Um, so that's, that's something a little bit different in terms of the zoning. And then there's a, a piece that may be on a different property that's zoned crossroads that really can't take advantage of, of the zoning. Um, so and there's a few other areas more on this edge um, that aren't exactly as per the, the survey plan and the property boundaries. Uh, another piece of it is, which we've known, um, is the portion of the property that abuts Haggis Parkway um, has been zoned Haggis Parkway uh, over the years, and, and that was deliberate. Um, but the more we've gotten kind of into the design of the project and this master planning process and it being integrated and connected and, and and all those things, we really like to have a conversation around having the entire property be zoned the same way. So we can kind of have predictability around planning board process and, and design and uh, et cetera. So that's uh, something we've already talked to, to Jay and, and Tom and Karen about and um, have some strategies around. But we want to introduce it to the council as, as something that we think is um, we, we feel is more of an adjustment based on the original intent in terms of the zone being the entire parcel. Um, the others we started to talk about a bit in, in our presentation around kind of market demand and, and the vision for the area along Payne Road. Um, and that top bullet is, is really um, allowing for some amount of that manufacturing, industrial flex, high tech um, kind of makers type space. And, um, there's, as Jim indicated, there's high demand for it um, in the region, uh, in Scarborough in particular. Um, and we think it can be a very productive part of the project early on from an uh, infrastructure standpoint, from a stimulating activity <coughs> project standpoint. And we think it can be done in a way that um, doesn't have any negative, negative impacts on the overall project. This is a big enough parcel. Um, that it can be buffered, that it can be designed in a way that, that feels right and that's integrated and, and can actually end up kind of complementing other aspects of the project. So uh, that's something that we want to start a conversation on and, and it's something that we'd hope to pursue in, in the short term with, with the council and the planning board. Um, another kind of zoning uh, nuance or idea is the signage. Um, there's nothing about the Scarborough Down sign that complies with the zoning ordinance right now. Um, but we see it as a pretty, pretty historic kind of iconic sign and would love to find some creative ways to be able to maintain it but kind of 
but make it contemporary and, and do some things that make it a new kind of gateway into the project. And um, so having some signage allowances that are kind of specific to the zone can enable maybe that sign in, in a new form, or maybe it is the way it is today, we don't, we don't know yet, um, to, to exist and, and maybe other signs that are kind of complementary <coughs> to that. Um, so we want to kind of talk a bit about the sign, just kind of given the uniqueness of it and the, its connection to the, to the property and the project. Um, the other couple things um, are related to kind of land uses uh, that are, you know, we don't want to do a lot of in the project, but we think there's a place for it in the market and also locationally in the project. And, and one is a convenience store kind of a gas station fuel station along the Payne Road area if that goes light industrial um, and also if we attract what we hope in terms of destination recreation and other amenities um, those fuel and convenience on Payne Road we think is is appropriate and could be fitting and, and would be designed in a way that's integrated that's not um, sort of an afterthought so that's something we'd like to talk about. And also the concept of drive through restaurants, um, not because we want to put drive throughs along Payne Road, Haggis Parkway, and Route 1, more because coffee shops and various restaurants in suburban locations <laughs> often include drive throughs So it's in grocery. It's, <clears throat> yeah, in grocery. Yeah. So we have um, to get a phone. Right, so it's, it's not really kind of the fast food joint that we have in mind. It's, it's kind of modern, higher end users uh, expect drive throughs And with kind of Nick's skills and the team skills, we don't think it's going to compromise design from a sort of a walkability standpoint or those other things, um, just given the approach we're taking with the project. So um, I'm going to keep moving because I know we want to save some time for the important part, the conversation. So this is my last slide, and it's, it's really just a to highlight and, and remind us and, and start some conversation around next steps. Um, Jay outlined the kind of the development side, the planning board side. We've started the planning board process through the conceptual infrastructure plan and, and got that approval. Um, and we're working now on the master plan step. We're focused on pod one, like we introduced that residential area. <coughs> and we want to work on that over the next few months um, to seek approval so that we can be kind of working on pod one as a first phase, um, you know, as early as the summer if, if possible. Um, because this is such a big site and it's the infrastructure that exists can hardly serve the demands that exist today, um, getting a start on infrastructure to, to enable future development is key. So we, we want to talk about, all right, how do we and start making some improvements into the sewer early on um, and have a conversation with the sanitary district on an issue in that. Question. And kind of following that first phase of development, you know, pods two and three that we're calling them, um, Payne Road and maybe towards Haggis Parkway, those could come along as users get interested. I mean, there's already interest in those areas um, later this year and early next year. So that's really kind of the development side flow and timeline that we're working on. And on the partnership side, we're obviously starting this evening on that on that column. And you know, as early as next month, if there's receptivity to the zoning ideas, we'd like to, to work with um, Jay and the Long Range Planning Committee and, and the council on <coughs> what those amendments look like um, over the course of the winter and spring. We want to kind of start conversations uh, with Jim's assistance on the, the kind of the TIF potential, that some type of agreement around a TIF and what that means um, for various components of the project. Karen's already, I think at Merida, she was overrun with inquiries because that was right after um, news broke of, of the acquisition, you know, marketing assistance. We see Setco playing a deep role on that and it's already happening. Um, and the last couple items are ROI <coughs> methods. I know the planning department is working on a return on investment model for the town. So we want to dovetail our efforts with that so that we're all working off that same methodology um, given the significance of that. And uh, the last one's community uses and assets, and I think that's a conversation for the next handful of years. So um, 
with that, I want to join the table and, and kind of let the conversation get started. Thanks. Hey, thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm sure all of us have some questions and comments. And <clears throat> why don't we just uh, sort of move around the room and uh, start? Uh, Chris, you want to start us off, and we'll just sort of head uh, head north. Okay, so I've got a series of questions and a comment at the end. Do you want me to just do one at a time and let everybody go? Or yeah, I think uh, pick, pick out something and we'll sort of... Okay. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I'll start with, um, do you guys foresee any use of, of character zones, kind of like we did at, down at Higgins Beach, where you've got a kind of theme for a neighborhood or kind of having a, a similar character or... How are you going to approach that kind of development and the commercial side of things as well? How do you, you know, you're going to have a, like a certain character you want the development to, to look like, or the pod's going to have a certain character versus the whole development? Um, curious to know how you might approach that. Um, I think the short answer is yes. I think we haven't figured out how that relates to the zoning yet. Mm -hmm. um, we have the ability to work the planning board on what the zoning looks like, and it could be very much based mm -hmm. on character like Higgins Beach, or it could be somewhere in between what Higgins Beach did and more conventional zoning. Nick has a lot of experience with that type of work in Maine, but also in other parts of the country. So the, op the potential is there, and I, I think the pods or the areas could kind of set up nicely for that in, in, in some way, particularly the, maybe that core, that mm -hmm. kind of downtown area that could occur. So um, if I could just add on to that, just to mention that as part of the, um, uh, in, in the zoning district, it does allow, it has very flexible space and bulk standards, so lot size, um, side yard setbacks, front yardage, um, street connectivity. Um, essentially, it allows that to be uh, determined by the planning board through the master plan review process. So it does, the zoning already has some of those elements in there. Um, and so by each pod or phase of development, the board and uh, developer can sort of work together on that. Katie. Um, just one. Have you thought about or considered, uh, you know, some kind of, it seems like a great opportunity to incorporate some alternative energy sources like solar. Uh, and I didn't know, particularly in that kind of core area, is that something you guys have tossed around at all? So that's something we, we, we've talked about it a little bit. We have not really explored a lot of that. Uh, but trying to, you know, we talked about it just the other day about trying to figure out where, you know, could we do some of the solar and where could it go? You know, where is it allowed? Those kinds of things. So it's, it, it's on our list for me to, to look into that. Great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exciting project. Uh, <coughs> One quick question, or maybe not so quick question, I'm kind of wearing my finance hat. Um, and we're starting the budget season, and as you know, we've just financed a new public safety building. But it sounds like in some of the conversations or presentations that when you talk about an ROI for us, it sounds like you're assuming some type of investment by the town in this mm -hmm. project, and if so, how much and when and what's the timing? Because we haven't had any conversations around financial support from the town for this. So I was just curious what you are assuming or expecting. Yeah, I, I can start with that, but yeah, feel free, right. Peter, or others. So um, two things. One is, even if there isn't any public investment, but there, when you think about it, there will be in terms of, like, even if it was, like, minor in terms of, like, gateways into it, uh, road impacts, off-site, if you will, or near-site. So regardless of it, of um, some specific projects that might be uh, ROI, like a community center or something like, or through a partnership like a TIF, you would still need an ROI. Like in other words, what what is this development um, going to have in terms of impacts on your services and schools, and how does that relate to the revenues that it's going to generate for the town? So that's one level of it, so that you can understand it in terms of preparing for it and also in terms of level of public and private partnerships. Right. So that, that's going to be really critical. And so far, what we've understood is that that's also a tool that you're building into your planning and development processes based on your plan of Palooza and the update of your comprehensive plan. So we've stressed all along, and Peter keeps reminding <coughs> me, that that work has to be 
the same data that you're using and we're using. So we plan on fully integrating with your ROI model, wanting some of our own stuff just to understand it, but also making sure that it's the common data is for the council and the town. Right, but I guess my specific question, when you saw Dan just share 18 and 19 pods, one and two, that's the budget we're working on right now. So those types of things, if you're looking for support, yeah, it'd be sooner good to know that. sooner yeah. than later because that needs to be factored into our conversations. I mean, especially if, if it is road infrastructure, that's probably got to go in before pods one and two. Yeah, okay. no, we agree. And we just we need a price tag and a ballpark number, and we need to have conversations as a as a council about does that fit yep. where we are financially because we are going to have some challenges. This year. We'll, we'll lay out a planning grid on our end as to how we see that coming together and see if we can't harmonize it with what your folks have in terms of timing. But you don't have a specific assumption or expectation at this point. Yeah. Thank you. Just if I could, I, forgive me, I, but I I don't envision the town necessarily investing heavily in the public infrastructure roads and what have you necessarily for the in the project where the assistance might come through is through a TIF arrangement which relies on future value created that doesn't exist today so it doesn't require any upfront investment it's funded over time based on the performance of the of the project right but we have a I mean we need to have that TIF conversation because yeah. right. those sometimes work sure. sometimes they don't That's, right. oh absolutely as long yeah. as we're not making any commitments at oh. this table right now for but, sure yeah. yeah and I didn't mean to socialize I didn't That's mean cool. within the within the site itself for public infrastructure and mm -hmm. investment but it might be like I'm sure as you go and plan it you're thinking about <coughs> where else in intersections are going to be impacted or elsewhere uh, within the community too so that leads into uh, my question, or my first question, which was around the, uh, I noticed on the last slide it referred to kind of a March time frame for that TIF agreement. I'm wondering if, if you could talk uh, conceptually in, in any more specifics, given that we're already February time frame, uh, kind of what, what you had in mind. Well, um, so I think in, in the, we, were, we had some early discussions, again, just for, um, to get a good understanding of, uh, with, um, with Tom and with Karen, but it's those things take a long time to get going, both in terms of the planning form and the approval, and then ultimately state approval as well. So it's never too soon to get going. So in other words, um, what we'd like to start doing, and the model can be tweaked over time, is to build the TIF model. And you guys have done these before. You already have. There are different kinds of development that you've done them for, but you have a model of terms of how you project revenues and how you understand the different impacts on the formulas. So early on, it's going to be important to get that model set up for the latest numbers and then start to run it through some of the scenarios of the development. And then as more development, as the market analysis gets done, as more discussions with the town gets done, you then can start getting refinements of that. And just assume it does not assume a TIF will be done. So that's just, we haven't discussed no. it. So. It doesn't assume one? I'm sorry. That we will do a TIF. We no, we haven't. No, no. That's part of the process, right. and we right. fully understand that. Okay. And just to yes, be sir. clear, there are two sides to the TIF. There's what the developer may want, but there are reasons for us to, even if they didn't want any participation in any type of investment, there are reasons why we want to we may want to consider a tip to shelter the amount of value that's coming online. So there's, you know, I think we've been having um, uh, discussions about how do we make the best of this from uh, uh, the town's perspective, um, regardless of what financial commitment um, somebody may ask for. Right. There's, could, could there's real benefits for us. What would, what would the benefit of sheltering the, the value be? So when you shelter the, um, the new value that comes online, um, it's the state holds it harmless from the school funding formula, from county taxes, um, and sharing. other and revenue, revenue sharing. sharing. And so, even though we may be at minimum receivership <coughs> yeah. for the schools, there's still benefits in terms of sheltering from the county, and in terms of protecting the amount of value that potentially could come online um, with this project, sheltering it for revenue sharing purposes. And beyond that, a TIF uh, gives us the ability to perhaps direct future mm -hmm. tax revenues to certain qualified purposes. Right. If there are priorities we want to fund, rather than it just going to general taxation and then be subject to annual allocation mm -hmm. through the budget process, you can set up through a development program uh, directed uses of that money. Those are all local dis uh, decisions. Gotcha. John. So, 
like Peter, <coughs> we all have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, planning is not one of my strengths. Um, you show me a really good picture and a plan and, and go me through, I'm fine. It's the money um, that is of, of interest. Sorry, I've got this cold. <coughs> so I'm also interested in the whole ROI model, particularly on this town side and the cost of services uh, kind of evaluation. Um, what I did want to ask more for our staff, um, do we do a rear view analysis of services? So we just did a public safety building. Um, can we look at that building and determine whether or not, at least it's specifically to public safety, whether that's suitable and can absorb the demand that this is going to increase on, you know, on the town as a whole? to see if it is still feasible based on that growth? Certainly the, the building as it's currently proposed has expansion capabilities yep. and it's built slightly bigger than is needed in day one. <laughs> That's just good planning. Um, I can't, I, I guess we could compare it now that we actually have something tangible. Uh, at the time that building was being discussed, this was, I guess. Oh no, I, I didn't know in our eye, but as part of that whole analysis that you yep. went through with the feasibility. Um, and whoever did the analysis, whether or not they could go back and do an amendment to that and, and look at what the impact would be. Sure. Yeah, on that facility specifically, <coughs> yes. I think it would be a good exercise for the town as even going forward with growth, um, especially with big projects that, you know, like that one. Well, I, I think you raise a good question because uh, the <coughs> scope of what the presentation provided us today would indicate this could be an enormously large project. Mm -hmm. And we have people who seem to have all the pieces in place to promote, facilitate that. And therefore, where we might be 20, 25 years from now, when our public safety building is only going to be 18 years old, right. uh, we ought to know, we ought to have some sense. Now, it's hard when it's this early on to be able to say, because market will drive a lot of what's going to happen. <clears throat> and you can't yeah. tell, just like the stock market uh, has uh, thrown us a curveball in recent days. So uh, it's not always easy to tell, but I do think we ought to make the effort. Same with well, the And the secondary uh, part of that is, um, especially knowing that we're having a very large project coming forward from the school department, is um, by looking at this feasibility study, what impact would it have on their school plans, um, and does it change yeah. it? Sure. I mean, all, all, all of that depends on housing type. Uh, number oh, of beds. I mean, all of the, mm -hmm. that's the ROI part that we should yeah. be keenly interested in. What does it mean for impact on the services, right. schools, fire, public works? School, school does their own survey and analysis of population yeah, growth not, and I, things I, like that. And they'll, this will obviously come into play. So I don't necessarily think we need to do a separate study. I think we no, just no, make no. sure if that that's included. I can included. reach out to the superintendent. Sure. Yes. They, and, they're they're and, aware. Ask yeah. them. Yeah, I think yeah. that would they be know what's going on. a if good partnership just, for us. If I could just add, because our... Again, not that we would do it here because you'd want to do it with someone from the town side too. But so just to sum it up, those studies typically take your school analyses, your public safety analyses, and real quickly they look at two things. They look at the, the phasing of development over time and how that impacts the average costs. So if we had one more student, two more students, but then they look at the collective impact of when are you going to out out. Um, Patient grow um, a, a building, a facility, the public stuff. works, and then they put it all together, and you're going to get net impacts. It is tough; you can't tell, but that's why you do what's called reasonable scenarios, and then you plan those, and they help you make decisions. And we can support that. We want to make sure that we work with the same data, so we're not competing on that kind of stuff. Jim Murray. Last but not least, um, I, I just had a few things I noted. First, I would it would be real important to, that there's no ability to drive straight through the uh, development. I noticed that the streets still, you know, because people cut through there, or will all the time. It's just a, I know that's playing board type thing, but it just came right off the top of my head. Um, I agree. Peter asked the same question I had. It's like I'm seeing this about tips, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not wild about tips just because it's taxpayers' money that you're putting up to give to a developer to do something. And I know that's short and sweet and whatever, but that's just where I come from and that's so what I want. I would, if I were to approve any TIFs, I would definitely want to see, well, what's in it for me? I mean, that's just how I am. Um, <clears throat> and by me, I mean the taxpayers of, of the town. Um, and just, uh, these are terms, I know what they mean, but people listening at home, mm -hmm have no clue what you're talking about with millennial housing, 
or light industrial or flex industrial. Could you give some examples of what you're talking about with that? Please? Yeah. <laughs> uh, millennials, the younger folks who are either renting or buying, uh, there's, I think it's the council in, in the town knows, there's demand for rental apartments, but also uh, smaller homes or homes that are on smaller lots. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of really more neighborhoods that are uh, denser, clustered, more walkable. So that's mm -hmm. that's an appeal, not just for millennials, but I think as Jim probably said it better than I, they are kind of creating a new market demand that others are more. warming up to. Yeah. Um, Less cars per household. Yeah. Right. Things like so that. So that access to transit, access to um, and really fast broadband. That kind of thing. <laughs> um, broadband, that's yeah. huge. Yeah. Really, fast broadband. really, really fast. Flex broadband. space is where there's some industrial space, but also some office and, and or and or space that can do a variety of different kind of um, industrial and manufact light manufacturing activities. But I'm not an expert on flex. So maybe yeah, so flex would be that plus another aspect of flex would typically be you might have a shell of a building where you're going to have more than one company right. in there, and someone might need 5,000 to start with, but they quickly might need another three. Right. So it's built in a way to be able to expand, and, and not everyone's getting exactly the same amount of space. Yeah, business incubators. They're, right. They're, right. they're startup business. Right. As an example of that, what's on industrial way? You know, the, 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 they look like garages. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah. one that's form that's of flex space. Form? Right. Yeah. They could be high end, though, mm -hmm. too. So I just want to. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I know what they are, but, yeah. the, but right. the community no, that's listening question. on. And then the other thing is, what do you talk about light industrial? Because I know people hear the word industrial and they think one thing, and light industrial is not SD Warren or, right. you know. Right. It's not heavy industrial. Heavy industrial. Um, <laughs> Light industrial are those kind of things. The flex space, the small manufacturing spaces, um, oh, that's really... high, te high technology type <coughs> uses. Um, we're not that interested in the heavy industrial, the smokestacks. And we're also not that interested in uh, a lot of kind of just just warehousing, or just a lot of paved area and trucking. Right. Warehousing is important, but in relationship to those other uses, not principally for distribution. Uh, in terms of, just real quick up on the, oh, it won't work on the screen. It won't work on, that. Work on yeah, the screen. Work on In terms of roads, this is the plan where things will be fixed, but the current idea is to modify how the road goes through yes. the site and actually connect Payne Road to Haggis Parkway principally and then come off of that down to Route 1 so it's yeah. not a thoroughfare. Um, nice but it's kind of connecting the more commercial industrial areas of the property, which want kind of more highway type roadways, and then be more residential down to Route One, so that you can get through, but you can't get through. And uh, you know, it's not a, it's not duplicating Heinz Parkway through the yeah. well, I'm I'm looking forward to this moving forward, um, and I know you talked about zoning and it's this chair board. It's my ears went okay. <laughs> so the sooner. You know, we can look at long range planning, it's going to look at some of it, and it may not come to ordinance because sometimes long range planning will work on it, doesn't need to come to ordinance. But I'm also on long range planning, of course, so. So yeah. you get some of this stuff out okay. there. Uh, I'm glad you pointed out that the the roadway that exists there now really is a high speed straightaway. Okay. People bomb through there, use it as a shortcut. That what you're proposing is a roadway that will come in and then hit intersections at which they will then go off to other either commercial or residential uh, settings. And so uh, I think that's important for people to realize that it's going to look dramatically different. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. Let's go around the table one more time with either comments or uh, questions, <coughs> if you want to say wrap-up comments, however you want to put it. Chris. So um, a couple quick comments first. Um, Piggybacking on Katie's question about uh, solar energy, I, I'm looking more at the sustainability aspect of it. That's yeah. one aspect of it. I'd like to see maybe some green design, um, energy efficiency, microgrid, all kinds of a, a plethora of things you can look at for modern sustainability. And that's that's a, I know that's a catch-all phrase, but um, we now have a sustainability coordinator, and that's going to be part of our big comprehensive plan as well. So um, I'd like to see some of that. Um, 
zoning changes, um, I think I, I, I don't see, I have no initial concerns for anything that was on the table. Uh, obviously, devil's in the details. We can work through that stuff, um, whether it's, you know, coming up with something specific for the existing grandfathered sign, or I'd like to see what you guys have in mind for the, some of the other gateways, um, whether you want to just replicate and duplicate, which may be an issue, or kind of get, get a feel for what your intentions are for that. Um, have you guys done a final survey yet? It seems kind of, there's some questions about <laughs> what land is where and who owns what. Well, we, so it, we have a final survey. Okay. Uh, we don't have 100% buy-in uh, from abutters oh, in this okay. area up here. Okay. And we're very confident that we're right. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Not, we're not 100% there yet. Okay. Is, is so that Warren that's, Woods? That's, uh, is that's that Warren Woods? Uh, soil, we're about Warren Woods, soil, Woods but in this area. But okay. there, were, there were three, the text map showed three right. mm -hmm. pieces of land here that were sort of landlocked pieces. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, we wound up owning one of them. There's two more down here. Uh, and there's, there's a little bit of a question mark about what, what goes on with that. So we're working through that. Again, yeah. we think what we're showing you now is correct. Okay. Um, but <clears throat> the, I guess the message is, you know, whatever we have, We'd like it all to be the same zone. Sure. It just seems to make sense uh, to yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, I'll weigh in on TIFFs just from the 50,000 foot view. Um, I think they're useful uh, as long as they're two way and you know the partnership is there. Um, I, I think TIFFs a bad word. I really like Ruth's an acronym which is <coughs> Community Investment. No, what credit it? enhancement. Credit, credit Community Enhancement Agreements or something. You know, you hit TIFF, everybody kind of cringes. It's yeah. kind of a nasty four-letter word. Um, but I do think uh, it's the right team. I think it's the right approach. I think we have a common vision and a shared vision, and I think that can come through in a, uh, a mutually agreeable <coughs> arrangement that um, obviously, as always, the devil's in the details, of course, but uh, I think that's a discussion that's well worth having. I don't think we get it done by March, but I think it's a good start uh, to sit down and start talking about what your expectations are, what ours might be, and then finding that, that middle ground and make it work. That's all I have. Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I guess I, in just in general terms, I'm very, very pleased that the project has landed in your hands. Um, I think having folks who know and love this community, as we all do, is couldn't have asked for a better partner. Um, so I'm excited about that. If you really come through with that community center in a pool, we'll become local heroes. Yeah. And uh, that will be a In our lifetime. In our lifetime. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I plan to live a long time. I don't know about you, so it yeah, better. Jerry's still um, <laughs> And then, uh, you know, in terms of some of the other things, there's nothing that I heard tonight that <coughs> caused huge red flags or any alarm bells. I do tend to be someone who processes slower, and questions come to me later. So one of the things you may want to think about uh, is what's your preferred communication protocol? How do you want us to interact and reach out to you as you start to go through this process? Um, and let us know that, because I think that's important. Otherwise, I'll just text Rocky like I always do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to step up Peter. I guess I'll echo what I guess for a great team. Welcome. Good luck. Um, it's exciting, but I, but I think I'll kind of direct the next comment probably to the chair and the town manager. I think kind of piggybacks on something Councillor Katarina and Maybine talked about, and that is, I think it'd behoove us at some point, we need to do a really in-depth sort of analysis of what this will do to town services and the demand and sort of the timing so we get a better idea of at least our planning process. That's one of our goals, to look out one, two, three years to see what's coming. You know, Council Baybine's already talked about the school has a project on their list, the library has a project on their list. I think it'd be really important for us to understand what the demand on services will be and what that might mean for investments in the town. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, well, so uh, I'd like to use my time uh, with a question. I was wondering if you could just uh, speak a little bit about how you plan to address the affordability requirement. It's a great question. Uh, we have a 10% requirement uh, of the housing in here has to be affordable. Uh, frankly, I think we have, uh, in multifamily, I think we have it figured out. I think we have a way to do it. Uh, we're doing it on uh, at Carrier Woods on Muzzy Road. Mm -hmm. uh, as for other pieces of it, I'm not sure that we have we have that figured out. Uh, and, and we had a long conversation about it yesterday amongst ourselves, and uh, <clears throat> we need to figure it out. Uh, we really need to get our heads in it and, and understand uh, what the requirements are, what they mean. Uh, How do they that, test? 
that requirement was lowered, the eight percent was lowered recently, and it's 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 going to be tough. I'll tell you that right now. It's going to be tough, uh, but we'll figure it out. And <coughs> if it can't be done, we'll figure out what the next best thing is. We want to make it happen. We want to make it happen. We want to make it happen. Thank you, Sean. Numbers are numbers. <coughs> just want to say thank you. I'm all set. Very good presentation. Um, I'm just thrilled with you guys are I'm closed on this. I'm like, yay, hallelujah. Um, and I'm looking forward to working. Yeah, I bet. I'm working with all of you on this. Um, I don't have any more questions or comments at this time. So. Thank you. Um, I, I think you have a very high functioning very capable town council who are all in, 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 in support of you people, know you, like you, respect you, and so there's tremendous momentum for this to be successful. Uh, what our role is, I would say we want to be facilitators, uh, we want to be collaborators. Uh, when you think about uh, some of the resources that are available to you, uh, to Chris's point, we have a sustainability coordinator who is terrific and easy to work with and who would be, would love to have you sit with her and say, what is your vision for a whole new town and town center? Uh, there'd, be, uh, there'd be some real value in that. The, house, the Housing Alliance, uh, uh, I think they're very excited about being able to support the effort, uh, as Will brought up, and he is our liaison to that, and rightly so, raised the question, because that's a big part of what we heard in the comprehensive plan was affordable housing and support that. So those are, those are more, being a sounding board, I think any one of us would be <laughs> delighted if you were to check in with us. I, as the chair, I'm gonna promote Having you back, you know, maybe an, at least once more uh, uh, in the next three, four, five months, and do this again, and just spend a couple hours. Just where are you getting to? Because you're moving fast, yeah. uh, and and so we we'd like to be able to know uh, where you are, um, and uh, I think we're also very mindful of being the protector the protector of the town's best interests in terms of financial issues, the town's best interests in terms of neighboring uh, residential areas that uh, may be impacted, uh, Sawyer Road. I think there's some, some real commitment to making sure that all of those things are done right because they can be done right and it can be made better for the neighboring properties, as well as the community as a whole. So that's kind of the, the, the vision that I see us having and the role that I want us to work closely. So. I think we're on the same page. Thank you, and, and the presentation was terrific. It went, uh, I think, met everyone's expectations of giving us an idea. I'm glad we got this maybe a month later then because I know you're moving fast. And so uh, thank you so much from all of us. Thank you for your time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Just one thing. I do expect there'll be a lot of interest.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the February 8th, 2018 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Glad to have everyone here. Uh, if you'd all rise and pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Councillor Baybine. Present. Councillor Rowan. Here. Councillor Foley. Here. Councillor Caterina. Here. <coughs> Councillor Hayes. Here. Councillor Cazzo. Here. Chairman Donovan. Present. Uh, we just had a, a, a workshop on the early plans for Scarborough Downs. Uh, it's certainly uh, anyone who's just tuning in now, it's well worth it to watch it. It was uh, uh, televised and will be up uh, on uh, our website uh, to be watched uh, uh, shortly. Um, general public comments. Uh, anyone wishing to address the council? Uh, please approach the podium. My name is Mo Erickson. I live down on Pine Point Road. Uh, just a quick comment about the uh, development at Scarborough Downs. Can't wait for that heated pool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good. I think that's well endorsed. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Minutes of January 17, 2018. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, any comments or corrections? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? None, thank you. Uh, adjustments to the agenda? There are none at the present time. Items to be signed are the treasurer's warrants, which I will do at the end of the meeting. <coughs> uh, order 18 006, 7 p.m. public hearing in action on the new request for a special amusement permit from Famous Dave's, located at 3 Cabola Boulevard. And I'll ask the town clerk to introduce this one for us. This is a requirement if you serve alcohol uh, on premise and uh, are doing entertainment like uh, trivias or um, karaoke or just have someone come in and play the guitar, you have to have a special amusement permit. Uh, there was a new requirement in that any abutter within 200 feet of the location were, uh, had to be notified. We did have two. One responded in favor, and the other one we did not hear back from. Good. Thank you. And no issues, and no issues. with the facility itself. Uh, uh, you probably are aware, uh, some months ago, we uh, uh, beefed up the special amusement permit so as to be able to catch uh, problem areas uh, before they become real problems for neighborhoods. And this is uh, oftentimes uh, outdoor entertainment uh, that uh, can get loud. And so this was sort of a first test of the new rules, and uh, this is all indoor entertainment, and the one abutter who got back said, obviously no problem as far as they were concerned. Uh, let's see, have we moved this? Uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. All in favor. Thank you. Order 18-007. Public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license and innkeeper's license from ABVI, Scarborough LLC, DBA, America's Best Value in Millbrook Motel, located at 321 U.S. Route 1. I'll ask the town clerk to do this. Uh, they, uh, this is a new owner. Uh, permits and licenses are non-transferable. Therefore, this is required to be before the town council for approval, and there are no outstanding issues. Thank you. Any member of the public interested in speaking to this item? Seeing none, I'll uh, accept the motion. So, so moved. Uh, any discussion, comment? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> order 17-109, act on the request for the Scarborough Town Council to order the discontinuance of all portions of Avenue 2 located southerly of King Street with no damages awarded to the abutting landowners and to file said order with the town clerk and to send abutting property owners notice of this action and schedule the public hearing for uh, Wednesday, February 21, 2018 and Wednesday, March 7, 2018. This is a matter that has been tabled from the January 17th, 2018 meeting. The uh, order itself is identical to the order that was tabled at that time, except we do uh, update the uh, hearing dates 
uh, as a matter of custom and practice so that the hearing dates would actually work. Uh, other than that, it is as it was tabled on January 17th. Uh, anyone, a uh, member of the public, wishing to address this issue, please approach the podium. Hi, this is Lily Ferguson, 331 Black Point Road. Um, I'm here to ask you to reconsider your approach to maintaining access to Avenue 2 extension for the right of way to the beach. Uh, the law on these phantom roads is confusing because it's divided between the, as you guys all know, <laughs> road law, Title 23, and real estate law, Title 33. The term paper streets is really a misnomer. In fact, both of those laws, they don't use the word paper street, they use the word way, public way and public rights of access. <clears throat> and, and, and according to Title 23, a way that has been used has not been deemed vacated. I realize you've gone back and forth on all kinds of this, but this road, this roadway, this path, this right of way, this street extension, all of those terms have been used since 1800s, and every map in the Registry of Deeds has shown a 50-foot right of way, including the Gables condos. Some actually have it surveyed. In fact, the prior owners, the Johnsons, testified to you at a previous hearing that they built the existing building. When they built the existing building, they were required to adhere to regulations governing a corner lot. This can be verified by checking records in the planning office. Despite the assumption made at first glance by your attorney, a paper street does not have to be constructed to street standards to have been used. And when the subdivision was accepted and the paved portion of Avenue 2 and the unpaved portion of Avenue 2, they both were accepted. Because why? Because its use began and its use continued. Uh, strength, maps in the Registry of Deeds strengthen this argument. I think the approach I think you should take to make this a win-win for the public and for Mr. Gendron, you should consider entering into a contract zone instead of discontinuing our rights to 50 feet that has been in constant use for 200 years. Giving up 40 feet of road is not in the town's best interest if there's an easier alternative that's satisfactory to both. A contract zone allows a reasonable use to benefit both the applicant and the public. The benefit to him, the house that he wants, and less taxes. The benefit to us, maintaining all 50 feet. <clears throat> Greater Portland Council of Governments, in a report, said, I quote, it is not necessary for a paper street to have been accepted by the town prior to its construction or use for it to cease being a paper street. Maine Municipal says, the road must be accepted by the legislative body or, mu or must be constructed and utilized as a private right of way, which it has been for over 100 years. <coughs> and they also clarified in 1997, MMA, which is a bunch of lawyers, <laughs> that the roads that were used but not accepted were not deemed vacated. <coughs> I encourage you to contact GP COG and MMA to see whether they still stand by these statements. And uh, the town's attorney made an assumption that a paper street needed to be built to street specifications. So in his rebuttal, uh, he made that assumption. This is not the case. The law does not establish that uh, there's any road co construction standards. In fact, <clears throat> like I said, it's confusing. So why not do a win-win for all of us, a contract zone? And why not be the town council that, protect, uh, that quits giving away valuable public land? And actually is a win-win for all of us. Uh, and I'll send you guys the documents that I referred to. In the, in the Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, anyone else wishing to address the council on uh, this order? Mo Erickson. I live in Pine Point on uh, 288 Pine Point Road. I grew up in Pine Point, and I've lived there all my life. Um, you know, in a similar vein, I guess I'd, I'd like to ask somebody on the council, why don't you be the one to change your mind and not give this, this pathway away? I feel like um, the minute you met Mr. Gendron and spoke to him, the deal was done. And I feel like you guys just, you talk about all the deliberations and all the work and effort that went into it, but I feel like for some of you, 
you knew right away you were going to give the land to Mr. Gendron, and you just give the townspeople a bunch of lip service. And um, I think it's really discouraging to know and uh, that I'm not the only one who feels like that, though I'm sometimes the only one who says it. Uh, I still feel like you're a town council that just doesn't listen. You just, do, you just don't listen to Pine Pointers. You have a vision for Pine Point that most people don't have and you are accommodating the lucky few and the powerful few who have money and influence and you listen to them and you just look at us and nod and say yeah yeah well oh well sorry and so now another street another pathway is going to be gone and i guarantee you there will be more because we all know that there are a few other residents in pine point who have pathways abutting their property and they want to make a deal. Well, there's really no deal. They want, the, they want to give away, which is what we've been doing, what the council has been doing all along, is giving away public access. <clears throat> and it's really discouraging. And all I can say is I hope that the townspeople use, use their brain and vote next time and vote some of you out because you just don't listen to us. And it's really, really discouraging. And I, 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 I said it before, and I'll say it again. You should be ashamed of yourself. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to address the town council on this matter? Close the public hearing. Uh, before I introduce our attorney, Ben McCall, to provide a little bit of information concerning the uh, framework of what's before us, this discontinuance, I did want to just touch upon, uh, for the benefit of those who, that sole person in Scarborough who might not have been aware of what's gone on, uh, this matter really has been before us for about the last two years. Uh, it has been uh, deliberated at length. We've had several workshops. Uh, we've had an extensive legal analysis by our council uh, to advise the board, and I, I think I know that I have uh, proceeded at all times with the goal of maintaining public access as it has been there for the last 100 to 200 years and uh, minimizing any adverse impact on the space there at all, the land, the right of way, that would uh, reduce uh, its scenic value to the community. And those have been the two cornerstones that I've sought as a part of the agreement to work things out with uh, Mr. Gendron and the Gables. And through the efforts of the Pine Point Neighborhood Association, uh, uh, who were very conscientious in uh, uh, sharing those values, uh, and the cooperation of Mr. Gendron and the Gables Condominium Association, we have uh, reach the point where we believe we have an agreement. Uh, it has to be uh, approved by this council. Uh, questions could arise or remain, but uh, those are the, that's the backdrop to how we got to where we are today. So, uh, uh, Attorney McCall, if you would give us uh, a little bit of your perspective on uh, aspects of this, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chairman Donovan. Uh, good evening, members of the council. Um, this is not the first time that we have met in this circumstance, but um, I'll be brief with, with what I'll say and then happy to answer any questions that would, that would be helpful. Um, you'll remember that the last time the council uh, deliberated about this uh, was really December 6th uh, of, of last year. Uh, to sort of set the context for where we were at that point, uh, the Gables uh, by the Sea Condominium Association, which is one of the abutters of this section of Avenue 2, had retained new counsel uh, a couple weeks before that December 6th meeting, had made some suggestions for changes uh, to the easement uh, that they would be granting to the town. Um, and it was the desire of the council at that point, uh, instead of uh, going forward with, with those changes as proposed, uh, for all of the parties who have been meeting in, in roundtable discussions to meet again in December uh, and attempt to come to some sort of agreement as, as that would befit uh, all the parties. 
So representatives of the Pine Point Neighborhood Association, uh, representatives of the Gables, uh, as well as uh, myself uh, and Tom Hall and Chairman Donovan uh, participated in a meeting uh, in late December. Uh, and out of that meeting uh, came four changes that are highlighted in your, in your documents today that I just want to uh, briefly touch upon. Um, the first major concern that the council had potentially had uh, back in December was uh, restrictions on public use uh, and, and <coughs> with whom uh, the enforcement uh, mechanism would, would lie. Um, the documents now clarify uh, any language that prohibited uh, drugs, alcohol, and set hours of operation is now gone. Uh, and instead, there's direct reference to Chapter 612 of the Town's Code of Ordinances, which sets out rules for public parks, which in effect uh, imposes the same types of restrictions uh, that would be on any any public park. Uh, the documents also make clear that uh, it'll be Scarborough PD that has the enforcement uh, power uh, for for this section of Avenue 2. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, because these are easements granted by two private parties to the town, um, there is a, a, a theoretical, hypothetical situation where a true, what we call an overburdening of the easement occurs. Um, these would rarely happen. Uh, you know, this is a situation where, uh, you know, for instance, a group of, of individuals, you know, decide to build the structure in the middle of the path or, or something like that that's truly outside of the scope of these easements. Um, both parties, uh, being the Gables and Mr. Gendron, would retain their right uh, to bring an action <coughs> um, as any other uh, holder of a private easement would. But I think uh, it's certainly the, you know, the spirit of the agreement that uh, it's Scarborough PD who will be enforcing this uh, the way they do any other um, uh, public park or, or, or way. Uh, there were also issues about signage. Um, the parties agreed that the sign placed at the, at the mouth of, of this path on King Street uh, will read uh, private uh, way to Pine Point Beach, motorized vehicles are prohibited. Public, Public way. Did yeah, I private. <laughs> that was a slip of tongue. My, my apologies. Um, there will also be two small signs uh, on the split rail fence on the gable side of the easement that will mark uh, that area as sensitive dune area, uh, which is certainly a fact uh, and also has the, uh, hope, the hopeful effect of, of causing people to not venture into, into that area. Um, so those were the four main, uh, the four main changes that were uh, made to the easements. Uh, beyond that, there, there really is no change uh, to what you saw in December uh, or back in, uh, in October. Um, I suppose I, I will note, although um, I know Alyssa Tibbetts, uh, a, a colleague of Charlie Katzlevy, uh, is here uh, if you have any questions uh, regarding the Gables. Uh, but I do know uh, through correspondence that we've gotten uh, from Attorney Katzlevy uh, that the board of the Gables uh, did meet, uh, did vote to uh, to approve this easement and to grant it to the town. Um, and I also received communication from, from Nick Skasha, uh, the president of that board, who unfortunately can't be here tonight, that uh, there is overwhelming support uh, and, and frankly no dissent among the membership uh, that I, I understand was something that the council was worried about uh, sort of from a theoretical level. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, uh, provide any more clarification. Thank you, uh, Attorney McCall. Uh, questions for Attorney McCall? Peter. Yeah, but to that last point, I thought I saw something where five voted approval, two abstained, or two didn't vote. Is that correct? So that was, the, <coughs> and, and Attorney no, Tibbetts I, I can. I thought it was this, this most recent one. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, the, the, the board. The board. Well, I know the board. Or they the said they also members. sent it out to all of the residents, and two of the residents didn't respond. Is that correct or not? I'm happy to defer to that, to that one. Um, I know the board approved it. But, so my question, so it's a two-part question. One, sure. if that's true, two, is there any legal risk to the two that didn't respond and voted no? Do they have any legal rights if they, for whatever reason, don't approve? I, I will take the second question and then uh, allow Attorney Tibbetts to, to answer the first. Um, as with any action of, of a town council, and I, I, I believe I've said this in previous meetings, um, there's always the remote possibility that an individual, any individual, frankly, in the town of Scarborough could challenge um, the action. Uh, 
that's unlikely to succeed in court, in my opinion, uh, you know, given the extensive process that we've gone through. Um, but the, the letter that we received from Attorney Katz Levy does detail first the, the legal authority of that board to, yeah, to grant those easements. And so at least, uh, you know, I was comfortable in, in sort of affirming that letter and, and, and the legal effect that that, that vote did have uh, for the Gables as a whole. Um, yeah, I saw the vote. I don't know I it's not the board vote. Attorney Davids, would you potentially be able to address the question raised by Councilor Hayes? I'd, Thank I'd you. be happy to. Uh, good evening, Alyssa Tibbetts. I'm an attorney at Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Attorney Katz Levy representing the Gables Association. Uh, and I can represent on behalf of Attorney Katz Levy his opinion, but also my opinion in having reviewed the file and all of these documents in answering this question. Um, the uh, board vote, the, or excuse me, the initial vote of five members with two abstentions was all of the unit owners. So there are seven unit owners. Five voted in favor of the initial easement document. Two abstained. Hmm. A later vote occurred by the executive board. One of the members who originally, or excuse me, one of the <coughs> unit owners who originally abstained is actually a member of the executive board who voted in favor of the easement ultimately. So there are four members of the executive board who have the authority under state law, the Maine Condominium Act, and under the declaration of the Condominium Association itself to act on behalf of the association. Uh, so they did that in approving, by taking a vote four to zero, which was a unanimous approval of the final easement document. Uh, the final, I guess, unit owner who would be, remain then in terms of those who originally abstained as unit owners abstained for the reason of a perceived conflict due to other property owned in the area and not for reasons of any kind of objection, if that provides you any comfort, remains an abstention. Um, nonetheless, it's our opinion that the executive board has the authority to approve that document and did by unanimous vote. <coughs> and can you confirm for us that the declaration of condominium is the controlling document for the purposes of giving authority to the executive committee? So Maine law states that an executive board has the authority to act on behalf of the association unless a declaration or the law states otherwise, and the declaration here does not state otherwise. So the executive board has the authority to act on, on the behalf of the association in this instance. Thank you. Any other questions for Attorney Tibbetts? Thank you. Uh, other questions uh, for Attorney McCall? Peter. I, I, from the prior speakers, Suzanne recently I've raised some issues. Can you address the issues that were raised this evening in the public comment at the very beginning? Well, all of them, I, to address all of them fully would probably take, uh, you know, a little more time and thought than obviously can be put into them on the, on the spot. Um, the issue of, of deemed vacation was brought up. Um, in my opinion, that sort of deals with a separate area of, of paper street law necessarily. Uh, which is the situation where, um, under the Maine Paper Streets Act, uh, a town had not uh, acted um, by 2007, September of 2007, to either accept um, an existing paper street that existed before 1987, um, or had decided to vacate it, uh, which is to release all rights that the town had, um, or to effectively kick the can down the road for, for 20 more years. Um, so the question of whether, uh, you know, whether Avenue 2 can be considered to be deemed vacated, um, I, I would say that Attorney Bannon and I have separate opinions on that. You know, the, the premise that the town has been acting in um, throughout this entire process is that uh, back in the 1950s, uh, the town, in fact, did accept um, Avenue 2. It's impossible to discontinue a, a road that has not been accepted. Um, so, you know, a deemed vacation is not necessarily applicable in this, in this situation. Um, there was also the issue of a contract zone brought up. Um, you know, under, under Maine law, the, the legislative body of the town does have the authority to uh, create contract zones. Um, I understand, I, I don't, under, don't understand or know whether that had ever been uh, contemplated in the situation. It certainly hasn't been contemplated as, as long as I've been involved. Um, and from the face of it, I, I would have some questions and concerns about the use of a contract zone uh, to affect one parcel and one parcel only. Um, yeah, I suppose I'd, I'd say that 
from the beginning, the, the town's stated objective in this was to protect public access uh, to Pine Point Beach um, and to decrease the effect that any possible discontinuance on this stretch of road would have. Um, and I think the documents that are before you tonight have achieved that goal. Um, there are certainly, uh, if we backtracked two years, uh, I, I suppose there are a, you know, alternatives or additional routes that could have been considered and taken, but uh, at this point that was not the route that we've been going down for the last two years. Um, I don't know if that completely answers your question. But. Uh, other questions? Councilor Roman. Yeah, I, I realize this is a difficult question, but um, were, were the, uh, the town's right of way um, to be decided in a uh, court of law. Um, do you have an opinion of the level of certainty that you have, given what you know, sure. about whether or not uh, the town of Scarborough would retain the, the right of way to, to this section of road? Right. So we, our firm drafted an opinion letter to that effect, I believe it was December of 2016. Mm -hmm. um, after having reviewed uh, Attorney Bannon's extensive research on the subject and doing our own extensive research, I think, as, as the chairman alluded to, um, our conclusion in that letter was that there's a great deal of uncertainty as, as to the status of, of this section of Avenue 2. Um, I, there are two plans, uh, not to get too far into it, but there are, you know, there are two plans, one from I believe 1875 and then one from approximately 10 years later um, that do show uh, portions of Avenue 2. Um, there is also an open question as to whether the town ever uh, had a legislative action that, that formally accepted that portion of Avenue 2. So we looked at it um, and our best legal opinion was that uh, we were uncertain as to how those rights would hold up in a court of law and based on that that was why our recommendation was to move forward with what Mr. Gendron was proposing, which would effectively take away the uncertainty because, as, as you know, if this were to, to come to court and the town were to not prevail, uh, there is no guarantee or, or responsibility on behalf of, of those abutters to allow public access. It would become fully private land, uh, not subject to any encumbrance or, or public access, and so this Know, presented the middle ground that we felt most comfortable with recommending. Thank you. Can I just ask one follow clarifying follow-up? Sure. I think you just stated it, but I just wanted to be clear. So were, so were this to end up in a court of law, and were the town of Scarborough to lose our, our right-of-way, what, what I'm hearing you say, excuse me, were, were the establishment of the town of Scarborough's right-of-way to be denied by a court of law. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I think I'm hearing you say is that we could potentially, the abutters could therefore take the path away from yes. public asset and mark right. it as private. So the risk that the town would run in that situation was, would, not, would, would be uh, that the court you know, finds that Avenue 2, that section of Avenue 2, was never formally accepted uh, by the town, and therefore title passes uh, from the center line to each abutter. And then you're correct. Um, there's certainly... There could be a, a negotiation at that point, but uh, you could understand that the leverage uh, in that situation uh, would shift. Okay. And then last, lastly, if I could. Mm -hmm. uh, so then, uh, however, by making this agreement, what, what's outlined here is a permanent right of way that guarantees that this path will, will exist in perpetuity uh, along that section of land. Correct. The, so what is happening here is the town is agreeing to discontinue any any rights that it has in this portion of Avenue 2 in exchange for receiving a, an easement from each abutter, uh, which clearly specifies the continued use as a public path. Um, and more to the point, uh, on both sides also has a very well thought out, I think, and detailed landscaping plan uh, that preserves uh, sort of the natural setting there. Um, and, and to cut to the heart of your question, yes, uh, easements when granted are, are perpetual. Um, that's uh, the intent of the documents and, and their effect also. Thank you. Councilor Fuller. Um, so mine kind of piggies backs on uh, Will's third point. So let's say we go forward, we discontinue uh, the land, and 50 years from now there's two new owners. 
um, or potentially obvious on the cable side, there's more. There's no possibility that they, those landowners in agreement could come back and want to extinguish the easement that they've granted to the town. Because I've seen cases where easements can be extinguished. So easements can end. Okay. Um, there are circumstances, legally speaking, where they can end. They can be extinguished by agreement of the two parties, okay. in theory. Um, I, you know, pers professionally don't think that likely in this in the circumstance. But um, you're correct. These these easements are perpetual in the sense that they run to the, uh, you know, the, the legal languages, heirs and assigns, et cetera, of of both parties, and so are intended to be that way. Right. And I and I don't question the intent of those there today. Sure. I'm trying to protect, you know, 100 years from now when I'm not or none of us in the room are even here anymore. So right. thank you. When I researched that issue. Uh, uh, the only exception to the in perpetuity circumstances was often challenges that said there's no reason or purpose for having the easement any longer. Uh, and that was the only circumstance outside an agreement to extinguish it. And if we had, for instance, uh, tidal conditions that caused the ocean to occupy that space in the future, that might be the basis on which because it would be rendered moot. And that was the only thing I found in the legal research that I did as a lawyer. There are other less common scenarios like abandonment, um, you know, where it's, it's clear that uh, the easement is no longer used. Um, it would also be a scenario, I suppose, if either easement owner uh, put up a physical barrier and the town did nothing about that, then over a course of years that could, that could be an issue also. Uh, again, these are not likely scenarios, but they have existed at some point in time. Any further questions from the council for returning the call? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, uh, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, and we'll have discussion, but first, if there are any uh, motions to amend, we'll accept those first. Councilor Katerina. Uh, yes, um, I would like to amend this, and I hope I'm doing this correctly, so bear with me, that we would strike everything after uh, semicolon and schedule the public hearing for Wednesday, February 21st, 2018, and Wednesday, March 7th, 2018, and replace it with, and to waiver holding public hearings scheduled for Wednesday, February 21st, 2018, and Wednesday, March 7th, 2018. And the reason that um, I would amend this uh, to do this is mm -hmm. it's my understanding Pardon? and everything I've seen. Oh, can I? What? Oh, OK. Oh. Tell me what I should be doing. So the only thing I can say, that the reason why two public hearings are included in the order is because that had been proposed as a solution earlier on. Uh, Section 3026A of Title 23 requires a public hearing. Uh, before a discontinuance can take effect. Yeah, so it can't be wavered by the body? It cannot be waived, no. Two, so two, one. Just one? You can, you can choose to have one. Okay. Uh, and then a final, uh, a final vote of this board would be required no fewer so I could, than So I days. could amend this then to, instead of, two, uh, to one. say, and schedule the public hearing for Wednesday, February 21st, 2018. You, you very well do. And strike everything after that? Yep, so long, okay. as, so long as that last meeting is that's another two weeks after. <laughs> do I have a second? For purposes of discussion, I'll second. Good. Uh, I think the uh, a motion to amend is seeking to uh, hold a public hearing rather than two public hearings. That's the purpose of the motion. And then we would still have a one further proceeding at which public comment is certainly going to be allowed as it was today. Uh, and that's the process, I think, that is contemplated by this amendment. Uh, yeah. And, and did you, want, could, me you want to speak to it? Please? Yeah, I'd like to speak very, very briefly to it. As you know, I left this town council in November or December, December of 2000, whatever 16. year it was, a couple years ago. 16. And this was being talked about then. And it's still going on now, two years later. Um, I, I would be hard pressed to find any other issue in this town that has been aired more thoroughly, had more attorneys involved, had more parties involved, had more people able to speak to it, that to me, just to use the old main terms, I'm fish a cut bait. Um, and I, I would 
think we need to move forward. So, I mean, I'm happy. Obviously, I don't want to be breaking any state laws to do with <laughs> with um, 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 uh, discontinuances. But, you know, frankly, this whole process, I, it sounds awful. It does sound awful to say, oh, we're going to order the discontinuance of this road. But basically, from a purely real estate point of view, all you're doing is clearing title. Because there's been all sorts of questions about who owns it and who has control and who doesn't. The bottom line for me is that we are guaranteeing public access in perpetuity to this property. And quite frankly, um, we could eventually end up perhaps getting a bit more tax money too if the abutter is able to do whatever the abutter is planning to do for their property. So, you know. Fisher Cup 8. That's where I'm at. Uh, Councilor. Thank you. It could have been called worse. Um, so um, I don't disagree with Council Katarina's logic behind this because to me, I think we're at a point where we could. But um, thinking through the process, we, we are the ones who made this promise and asked for it to be part of this. Is, I don't believe any group um, asked for this. I don't recall that anyway, so I think this was something that we put forward. And I think that we need to hold ourselves to the fact that we did make this promise and that we should have the two hearings. If anything, though, it might be a good uh, test case to uh, consider um, if this subject comes up again, whether or not we really want to enter into that type of promise up front um, rather than waiting until we get to this point. So um, I'm going to vote against the amendment, um, just so you know. I don't want you to be upset. but. I think we need to keep a promise. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, so um, I, I uh, also um, feel like we're not required to have the two hearings. However, we did say that we were going to have the two hearings. Um, but I lament the fact that uh, uh, I appreciate the sentiment because, um, as you can see in the audience, we have several lawyers in the room uh, with a very high billing rate um, that are going to be required to be here. And it's too bad that we have two hearings. Um, but I think that because we said that we were going to, we should continue. Other comments? Very similar to uh, what Councillor Bevine and Councillor Rowan both said, but I also just feel like, um, while well, for us sometimes it feels like we're hitting our heads against a brick wall and talking something to agnosium and to death to the public, it's not always the same way because they're not behind the desk and they're not living it the same way that we are. Um, so I think we stick to the process. I think that's the right way to go. Other comments? Councillor Hayes. Yeah, I kind of echo what we just heard, but for slightly different reasons too, there'll be something else, a couple other agenda items. I think this year our goals were to reestablish trust and transparency with our constituents. So I absolutely agree. If we had announced that it's gonna be our process, <coughs> to change it just doesn't further that in. So I think we announced it, we committed to it. I think we should do it. I think we should give everybody plenty of opportunity to express their opinion. So I also won't support shortening it. Thank you. Councilor Kidd, is it? So I have two questions. Um, first is, what does um, removing a second public hearing do to the process? And likewise, what does keeping it in do to the process in terms of uh, the outcome? Do we have to, is there an adjustment to, do we, do we have a certain amount of time that we have to file this in order for it to take effect at a certain time? No. Or, so, so there's really no effect other than just timing. So my second question would be, um, do we need to have legal counsel present at a public hearing? Is that a requirement for this issue? No. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. I, I think my sense is that uh, uh, while we don't have to have our counsel here, I think all the people who have, and I really applaud the patience of both sides of this question because uh, they've been respectful and uh, uh, cooperative, and we have reached what I think is a, 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 a good agreement. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, when you come up with the idea that you're going to hold multiple hearings, even though you don't have to, uh, but now the parties have uh, on each side come together, found common ground, uh, there really is no longer the reason for doing that. And these things aren't free. Uh, for the parties who have their counsel present uh, or for themselves coming out on a cold winter night. Uh, so it seems to me to be very practical to uh, hold one public hearing. Uh, but that's just my point of view. 
Council Rowling. So, um, I just want to go back to when we decided we were going to have two, two hearings. I, I think part of the reason was just the unique nature of the fact that this is a uh, basically a summer, a, a lot of the, the uh, owners down there are only here in the summer. And because we're doing this off season, it was to extend the period so that we could hopefully hear from all of the owners. So I think they're, they're, um, uh, that was kind of the intent. Um, and so I think that, that it's also a feather in the cap for why we should retain it. Any other comments? Councilor Kettering. I've heard enough. I will withdraw my. <laughs> I will withdraw the amendment. Thank you. Just keep the, everybody in. Uh, will the second <laughs> concur in that withdrawal? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, discussion on the main motion. Councilor Kennedy. Uh, yes. Oh, What's your okay. name? Yeah. <laughs> One of the, you on the end. Um, so I. I I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I do think this is a win-win scenario. I really do. Um, we've had public involvement. We are maintaining the public pathway forever. Um, the, resident, the residents in question now have the legal ability to develop the property the way that they want to. Um, we're going to increase the tax base, and um, we're not going to be engaging in a long and costly legal battle. Um, so I, I think the process is something that, you know, other communities who we read in the paper are going through might want to wish to mimic this process. Um, we've had neighborhood groups who've been involved and they've approved of the process. We've had the landowners involved who, and they've engaged and they've approved of the process. Um, the process has taken nearly two years um, with public input at every appropriate opportunity and um, and then some, I think. So I do think it's time to finally move the question. Um, I will support that, the, obviously, we'll have the two hearings because that's what we agreed to. I think at this point it's moot. We have an agreement on the table. Um, but if uh, I, I don't see any information that may come to light in the next two hearings that will adjust that. Um, but you know, if that's the will of the people, then so be it. But I do think it's time, to Councilor Katarina's point, to, to move on, move this issue forward, and, and resolve it. Thank you. Other comments? Um, so I think everyone knows where I stand on this. I, I don't support discontinuance for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is I, I do believe the town owns the land. I don't. I believe this is different from other areas where we have done discontinuance because there's, there's not a hardship on this landowner. Uh, and there were some other creative ways we could have or afforded him a, an ability to still build what he wanted to build there. Um, <coughs> the only ongoing concern I, I do have is um, we did recently get some information around what we could expect for a uh, tax increase potentially and the fact that it doesn't seem to be an equitable split. Um, so I'd like to follow up and get some more uh, information on exactly the reasoning why and I just haven't had the time to do that. So that's for me that's another reason why giving us a little bit more time will allow me to get those answers and maybe I'll get more comfortable. Although. Admittedly, it's not likely to change my position on, uh, on the overall. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk through kind of, kind of uh, where I'm coming from. I am going to support the, uh, the motion um, that uh, uh, I've heard a lot of people say that we're, you know, somehow this is land that we own. Um, it's, it's not an asset of the town in terms of something that we could buy or sell. Uh, we, can, we, we can't sell this to somebody and have them build a house there. Um, we couldn't put a park there. Um, we have a right of way, uh, which gives us the ability to uh, allow the public to travel over it. Um, we could pave it. Um, we could run utilities down it. But it 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 runs, you know, 100 feet or so, and uh, to the beach. And there's no reason why we would do anything to it other than what already exists there, which is a walking path. Um, and um, there is a. Um, I do have a, a concern. I don't think this is a perfect agreement because we do have to, to change the path that's been there for 150 years, and I think that it's it's too bad that we do. Um, but in order to have it go down the middle of the, the now 10-foot right of way that we're going to have, um, it, it does have to change. Um, we also have the uh, conservation easement, which means that you can't put a structure there, so neither of the abutters has the ability to build inside of that 50-foot 50 um, 50 zone. Um, I think that um, that we're not giving something away for nothing. We're getting a guarantee that we have access to this uh, forever, unless there's some kind of circumstance whereby we've abandoned this, or um, uh, as long as the public wants to use this this land, the town of Scarborough is going to be on the hook to make sure that if somebody puts up a fence, we take it down. Um, but it's on us um, to make sure that that path stays there. Um, and But this agreement gives us the right to always have a path there. 
Um, and so I, I think that it, it really is in the best interest of all of the people in town. Um, I'd like to think that, that also that uh, uh, a lot of the neighbors would agree to that. Um, and I think that they, um, they've come together at least to make this a, a, a palatable agreement. So we worked through a number of issues over the last two years. Um, and most recently, the, the uh, changes that have been worked through around um, selective enforcement or who has the right to enforce. Um, so I think that we've come to um, a reasonable accommodation, um, and I'm going to support it. Thank you. Councilor Beva? Mr. Hayes has his hand up first. Councilor Hayes. <laughs> um, I guess it, you know, it's probably no surprise I've been in this place, the same place, for the two and a half years, however long we've talked about it. I, I'm not going to support it for a variety of reasons. I'll probably give some more to them, but there are a couple things that have been said tonight that, that do bother me a little bit. And one is, even the groups that participated in negotiating the deal, and I agree, they, 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 they did it, they did it in good faith, They, but they will say this is not their first choice. Their first choice is not to continue, discontinue Avenue 2. So they have they have made you know, lemonade out of lemons. They, they really have crafted something that they can live with, which is kudos to them. Two, I've talked to a lot of people, and you heard tonight something about are we listening. I have the emails I've gotten, and to everybody I've talked to, no one is in favor that I have talked to of giving away or discontinuing Avenue 2. Folks are saying they really think this is something the town should retain. Um, it was said tonight that it, there's, there's two legal risks here. All you have to do is look what's happened in Cape Elizabeth. Yes, we may, we may avoid one legal risk, but we're going to have another legal risk, which, you know, private rights, and we already know that, that, you know, some of the beach communities are very savvy. They have resources. I think there is some risk that we're still going to be in a protracted battle about this as this goes down the pathway. And most importantly, I was really concerned about when it was described tonight, when it did come to us in December, one of the abutters wanted to be able to restrict use and access to the path at certain times and certain things and create their own policing of the path. I think that bodes that down the road that may be some, some problems for us. So I, I don't support discontinuing this. I think we should retain it and see where it goes. Councilor Beba. Um, I use history a lot um, because I've been around for uh, quite a few councils. Um, been on this council when both uh, when Avenue five, six, and seven have all been discontinued. Um, all, sorry, five and six we retained the public access piece of that. Seven we did not because of its proximity to the beach, already where it is, and it made sense not to because of, it was so darn close to that little co-op beach, anyways. So I use those as kind of an example for me at least, and how I've made the decision over time, and the fact that we are keeping public access. Um, the, well, let me back this up. The fact that we're authorizing the discontinuance tells me that we are accepting and, and stating that this is our property, because otherwise why would we be discontinuing something that we don't own? Um, the fact that uh, how I looked at the other properties um, or the other pathways um, does influence that. Um, I do want to mention that um, there's been a reference to the Cape Elizabeth uh, uh, kind of issue that's happening. Um, if I understand, though, that issue is actually almost a complete opposite because the town is actually stating, well, it's kind of the same. They're stating that um, the path, uh, their avenue or whatever that road is called is theirs and they don't want to give up the public access and the, the butters are suing, stating, no, it's our path and you can't use it. So it's a very, very different scenario in which the landowners are actually exercising what they believe is their right. And we could be in that same situation if we went down that path. And I think if anything, if we look at um, other, other situations in town about lawsuits, um, maybe a lesson learned is about coming to a compromise, finding a solution that everyone can agree to while it might not be perfect, um, does benefit the town as a whole. And I think that this is a good example of that happening. And so um, I support this, have ever since uh, day one, and I think that this is a good solution because it continues the pathway. Uh, and maybe the pathway can be called the Avenue 2 pathway, so at least it keeps its historical name or some type of configuration and gets com you know, commemorated in the signage. Thank you. Uh, other comments? Uh, just so we're clear, because there's no doubt about this, at best, the town has a public access right-of-way, an easement. It doesn't own this land. And any reference that you hear to the town owning the land 
It's just not true. It's only an easement. That's all towns get uh, historically mm -hmm. for roadways. So, so that that's what. If we won, all we get is what Mr. Jenner and the Gables are saying they're willing to give us: public access easement. <coughs> Uh, and in this case, we're restricting all the other uses uh, largely that could, the land could be put to. So that uh, the town's practical rights match up nicely with what this agreement, and which is really a resolution of a dispute, uh, allows us to do. Uh, so, uh, further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Uh, new business, order number 18-008. First reading and waive the second reading on the request from the town manager to expend $77,950 from the undesignated fund balance for the commercial industrial revaluation. And I'll ask the town manager to introduce this matter. Yes, thank you, Chairman Donovan. Um, really since uh, 2014, when this matter went to the full, uh, to the voters in terms of conducting a townwide revaluation, and we lost fairly handily, as I recall, I've been thinking of ways and how and when to advance this same idea again. Uh, the sorts of things that we identified back then have only continued to worsen, frankly. And it's really only because I've had challenges in the assessing office in terms of long-term stability and did not want to advance such an important project until I had confidence that we had um, our house in order, so to speak. Uh, so really presented with the opportunity late last fall of straightening out some of those staff issues did I feel comfortable um, exploring this further. <coughs> And to really satisfy my curiosity, I did issue an RFP to see if there were any qualified firms that were capable of doing this work. And I did receive two proposals from very qualified firms. And uh, I guess to my surprise and somewhat delight, uh, they were able to actually do it uh, much quicker than I thought. And so I present this to you really as an opportunity. Certainly the town could wait and do this at some future point, perhaps part of a town-wide revaluation effort. Uh, but the opportunity uh, does present itself to address uh, what I would characterize as kind of the most egregious, and by that I mean um, this, these classes of property, commercial and industrial, are uh, very well documented to be the most um, out of whack, if you will, that's a highly technical term, uh, from market. Um, on average, they're about 10 percent of market value based on sales analysis, and that trend's been confirmed year over year. Um, so I do present this to you as an opportunity. It is somewhat time sensitive, and as the motion was uh, prepared, it did consider waiving the second reading. I've since had the opportunity to talk to the cons consultant and understand more about their timeline. Uh, it's possible to uh, follow your normal adoption procedure and still stay on track. Uh, this work would commence in, in March. Um, there was the opportunity for the Finance Committee to talk about this matter, and I'll let members uh, of that committee speak to it. Um, for my purposes, the big takeaway I received was, let's do everything we can to get uh, the word out to the folks. And on that front, uh, I do have two occasions next week, um, SEDCO board meeting. This matter is on the agenda. Uh, that's a fairly small audience, but they have wide reach. More importantly, the following day, I'm addressing the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce in the annual um, State of the Town address, if you will. And I'll make sure that this is a highlight of that conversation. And lastly, I'm coordinating with SEDCO to do direct outreach to their email distribution list of 800 uh, active, you know, good uh, addresses. So I feel as though I'll have good, kind of good uh, access, and I'll be making them aware of how to voice their concern, including when this matter comes back to the council. So you'll be hearing about that as well. Um, with that, I think I guess I'll stop. I'm certainly pleased to answer any questions you have. Any questions? Yes, Councilor Roman. Could you just address the the impact that this would have? Like, for, which this would be for? My understanding is for the tax bills that are going out in September. Yes, this would be done in time. Uh, this would be values as of April first of this year, and in time for the, this upcoming commitment in in August of 2018. So for the next taxes to be issued, 
and it would be located, it would be specific to the commercial industrial classes and all the properties in those classes, not portions of them, but the entire classes. And I think that's probably an important distinction to, to draw, though I think we have the legal authority to do partial revaluations. In fact, the law court um, said as much. Mm -hmm. um, I feel even more confident uh, because we're doing entire classes of property uh, that we could withstand any possible challenge should it come. But this is fairly common. There are examples all over the state where uh, this approach is taken. Uh, the question is the I, time manager. Um, Roman. Actually, I'm happy to wait my turn. No, cool. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, could you so I look at uh, revaluations as a, as a uh, fundamental fairness issue to make sure that everyone is paying their fair share. Can you speak at all to um, the, the impact that this, is, this out of whackness uh, yeah. has had upon the uh, residential sure. owners in, in the town? Yeah, the cornerstone of any uh, ad valorem tax program, which we have, real estate uh, property tax, is is equity. And Maine Constitution requires that all properties be valued at 100% of market value. Uh, that's impossible. That's a, a moving target. Mm -hmm. Different classes of property react differently than each other. Um, and so we have um, challenges uh, always. But uh, this is this I called it egregious. It's um, it's been documented year over year that it's consistently, um, we're undervaluing this property. And the practical effect of that is that when someone is paying less than their fair share, someone else is paying more than their fair share. And the difference is seen in the tax rate. <clears throat> Make no mistake, the town sees no more money. We don't see dollar one more from this. It simply reestablishes, redistributes redistribu who should be paying what. So, so just so I'm clear, so as a homeowner, because I, I don't have a commercial or industrial property, I'm paying slightly more because the commercial and industrial properties, because their valuation is under market, are paying slightly less. Correct. I've estimated uh, through a financial model, very simple one, that there's as much as $175 million in value that's not been realized by virtue of that. And that will show its effect in reducing the tax rate. I'm not in a position to advise what that will be, sure. uh, but that would, that would be where you see it in a lower tax rate. And I, the final piece I should have mentioned, uh, essential to all of this is to immediately look at the residential side because there are inequities there as well. Um, and to that end, I do intend to request funding through the FY19 budget to do that. So <clears throat> we would, in a perfect world, we'd immediately move into the residential side uh, immediately thereafter. Councilor um, Kazan. <clears throat> if I could through the chair, um, could you, could the town manager state what um, the best practice percentages of fair market value before a community should act and also what the statutory limit is yeah, before a community should act? And then finally, where, what percentage of the valuation we estimate that we're at right now? Uh, the average sale ratio of commercial industrial properties is 76% right now. Mm -hmm. uh, statute requires anything below 70%, you must do a reval. Um, I, I don't, beyond that, I think, Many communities use 90% as kind of a trigger point. So I, I think we're very solidly in the area that it needs attention, uh, really for the uh, equity issues that were raised earlier. Okay, thank you. Other questions of the town manager? Oh, no, sorry, no, 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 no. I don't have any questions. Peter. No more questions, but a motion to... No, I'm gonna... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Any member of the public wishing to address this uh, order, please step forward. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Howard for Oakdale Drive. Um, I'm in support of this reevaluation and everything that I read. It made sense. My only concern was the uh, timeliness of it that was originally documented, but as Mr. Hall pointed out tonight, it can follow the normal procedure. Uh, my concern was it is $76,000. That's a lot of money to uh, just push through in one night, especially when. Uh, budgets have been decided by quantities uh, in that sort of range. So if we were just going to have one night and that be done and said, that was my concern. But that being not the case, I, I'm fully in support of uh, uh, this. So thank you. Thank you. Other uh, members of the public? Seeing none, we'll close that. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, take uh, 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 motions to amend, uh, followed by uh, comments. Uh, Councilor Gatorino. I guess I'm Ms. Amendment tonight. I would uh, amend 
this uh, order 18008 to read first reading and schedule a second reading for February 21st, 2018, on the request from the town manager to expend 77950 from the undesignated fund balance for the commercial industrial revaluation. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Councilor Gettering. Yeah, um, the reason I would do this, I went to the finance meeting and listened to all of them back and forth and whatever, and, I, you know, and, and listening to um, Mr. Howard, who spoke here. And I think, yeah, having one more um, night for people to speak to it is fine. I know that we would like to get this going. I believe March 1st is, is what we're looking at. I mean, we're looking at a time frame. You've got to get this done. It can't be hanging out there. But I, I'm certainly willing to uh, give it one more night for, for a second reading. And uh, the town manager was able to speak with the KRT appraisal people to determine that he, we are able to squeeze out a couple more weeks. And we always want to follow uh, regular procedure if we can. Uh, other comments? Councilor Foley. I was just going to say thank you. I, that was my big concern was, again, just not I, – I'm never comfortable with a one-and-done vote uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, so I appreciate the time extension. Councilor Rowan. Yeah, I'm also appreciative, uh, I, and I'm uh, also appreciative that we will be reaching out to Chamber of Commerce and the mm -hmm. Co to uh, to let the business community know that this is coming and give them an opportunity to weigh in. Um, and this allows us to do so um, and have another reading. Anyone else uh, wishing to comment on the motion to amend? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Uh, six to one. Uh, we're back to the main motion. Discussion. Uh, so while I oppose the amendment, I do agree with this um, uh, consideration. Um, it's very important, and I, too, looked at the inequity issue because, um, and we did talk about this pretty extensively at the Finance Committee. Um, the fact is, is that when we throw out data, such as what the estimated value might be, what the tax dollar mi rate might be, um, the impact to a budget is really speculative because the valuation process could come back either um, higher than the, the, um, the information that was shared. It could come back lower. I think in this particular group, though, you're probably not going to see it um, as um, um, uh, volatile. And, and the residential side um, will eventually see where probably this is where, you know, Mr. Hall has said, um, and he's right, um, one third will definitely go down, one third will definitely go up, and then the other third will probably stay right up exactly the same. It's because of the, the population size. I think there was, what, 720 to 800 businesses that are part of the evaluation, so your size is much smaller, therefore you're not going to see that type of volatility where on the residential side you have, what, I think it was seven. 7,200 to 8,000. Yeah, it's so, it's um, which, and, the, and at the Finance Committee meeting, we express a very strong cons, uh, desire to also move forward quickly um, and uh, um, starting the residential piece because there needs to be a balance between the two, uh, especially as we talk about long range planning around finances. <coughs> so, um, I think that this is an important step forward and support it and have ever since it was a council goal two years ago. And we, and we did have a finance committee meeting on this, and so I'm going to ask the chair of the finance committee to provide a little report on that meeting. Yeah, we did. We had that. We, we had a special meeting. That was the, the one item we did discuss. I think. I think we're all in agreement that a reval needs to be done for the community. I think we had some different thoughts around things. I think one of the concerns I think we did get to is because this has come up. We are concerned about, we're not sure the business community is, is aware, so that was a suggestion. I think you know, Tom committed to reaching out to the business community to get some feedback, mm -hmm. feedback which I think is important for the second read. Um, so I, I think that was sort of where we ended up as a finance committee to, to move forward. As I think everybody agrees a reval should be done. I, I'll have some reserve some comments for later about some maybe the sequencing of that, but that, that was our recommendation that we go to the second read and get the business community feedback. Thank you. Councilor Caterina. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think this is truly an equity <clears throat> issue. Um, right now, as has been mentioned, our commercial uh, side, industrial side, is being borne up by you know, the little old lady down the street who's struggling to pay her property taxes. And I don't think that's right, um, to be honest with you. Um, I When I ran to get back on the council this summer, I talked to people about this when they said, well, what would you plan to do to help with property tax? Um, and I talked about how we could get the mill, mill rate lower 
by doing this sort of thing, to do a commercial industrial reval in particular, which I think is very important uh, for this community. I think people at home need to understand that this, this increase is not on home occupations. So just because you were running a business out of your house doesn't mean your tax is going to go up. It's real estate. So it will be the owners of commercial, industrial, real estate, those who own the buildings, who will see an increase in their valuation um, once this is done, um, which I think, you know, is fair. It needs to be done. I know there's an argument out there, well, you know, business people will end up paying it because their lease of rent will go up. Well, yeah. I mean, they're going to have to chip in at some point, but it depends on, you know, what your lease, how long your leases are for and what the impact will be. And I think for most people, it won't be an immediate impact. But um, so I'm very supportive of this. Thank you. Councilor Gazel. Yeah, so um, obviously as the third member of the finance who participated in the discussions, and I, I thought they were, they were very, um, very, very thorough, I guess, um, depend for, for what we had in front of us. Um, I will say that um, the longer we wait, uh, the, the, long, the larger this disparaging difference is. And, um, you know, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I recall asking if the third, third, third is, is relevant with commercial industrial at this stage, and it's not because of the, right. the, the large decrease in valuation. So no one likes to pay taxes, no one wants to pay taxes, but it's really, in my mind, a question of equity and fairness. And um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little challenged with the statement that the, the, the residential is bearing the burden of that more so. There is an equity there, but there's also an equity on the residential side, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, tax fairness and tax equity is a universal issue. <coughs> it's not specific to one group, residential, commercial, industrial. And I think we've got a responsibility to make sure that that is as an equitable as process as, pro as possible. And the longer we wait, the worse that difference is going to be and the harder that impact is going to be for the town to absorb it. So I, I'm all for moving this forward um, <coughs> and I also, would also support moving into residential as, as quickly as, as possible after that. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I think a um, couple things. One, one, I just want to say um, there's no guarantee that I mean, a statement was just made that by doing this commercial reval that individual property taxes will go down. That's not necessarily mm -hmm. true because we'll have more town valuation in dollars, but we also have this year's budget we're, we're contending with. So my guess is that the mill rate, the taxes probably won't be going down. They, the increase may be less than it was otherwise, but I just want to make sure we're not setting expectations that we're not going to meet. For me, I think absolutely the question about fairness and equity, there should be done. The question that I just brought up is, is more of the optics thing. You know, part of what our goals were this year as a finance committee is to do a better job of doing financial planning, strategic planning. What does concern me, I think we just heard from, from Mr. Howard that, you know, to me, the revaluation should be in our budget <coughs> process. We should be having that conversation as we're deciding <coughs> priorities for the town. This year during the budget process, we were chasing thousands of dollars at Pine Point Beach Cleaning and hours at Higgins Beach. This is a $77,000 unbudgeted item. And as you heard the town manager say, we've known this for a while. This is not new information. It should be part of our you know, planning process. So I have a concern about that. The second concern is, having been in business, we're talking about if, if, if the assessed value is 76% of full value, you're talking about businesses maybe getting hit with a tax increase of 24% this fall. And if you're in business, most businesses are on a calendar year budget. The big box stores, the store managers, and the employees in that store are responsible for budgets. If they come in over budget, the first thing they do is they cut payroll hours. So I think we need to reach out. I think that's why we as a finance committee said, Maybe the business communities will be fine with this, but I think we need to do that, reach out. We need to make them aware of what's coming. If they're okay with it, that's great. But I, I am concerned we need to do a better job with financial planning. This type of thing should go into the annual budget so we can make choices. This is an unfunded, unbudgeted item that we should have anticipated. So that, that's my issue. I think we need to do an evaluation. I'd rather do it everybody at the same time so everybody's on a level playing field so we don't have one group feeling like somehow they've been they've been you know singled out and there's also an issue of optics that a total revaluation the last time we looked at this was over five hundred thousand dollars so we had talked about bonding at that time which means it had to go to the polls if we break it up in two sections 
The optics might be we're trying to avoid that. So I, there's some optics and some trust and some transparency issues that impact me and just how I'm perceiving this. Thank you. Councilor Gazer. Um, so I, I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm clear about this. We're not, the, the discussion of mill rate versus valuation are two separate discussions. We're talking about valuation and that's what the property's value at. The mill rate is established at the end of the budget cycle at a certain time when the assessment value comes in and, and that's, they're, they're, they are linked in terms of your tax bill, but nothing that we're doing here is affecting mill rate. It's valuation only. Is that correct? That is correct. Right, we can't make a statement about which way the tax rate's that, gonna go, which is what we did. That's, that's not, that's not the, the purpose of the revaluation is to reestablish the values mm -hmm. of the property. It has nothing to do with mill rate. Well, valuation is right. one of the two key variables in that calculation. So. It, yes, but I'm just saying yes. that it's, we don't, to the point is, is we don't know what that impact is going to right. be. Yeah. So I just want to be clear right. that, that, that that's clear to the public that we're not setting the tax rate right now. We're setting the valuation rate, what the property values are at. Um, the second thing is, I, in, and you know, we did discuss this a little bit in yeah. finance yeah. about the, you know, the fact that businesses could potentially be seeing a large tax increase. You know, the, the flip side of that is they've been undervalued for, in my opinion, if you're undervalued for a certain amount of time, you're relying on that, that undervaluation <coughs> for your business model is probably not an appropriate business model. You've been benefiting from the fact that we haven't been valuating. We haven't, we haven't had a, a, a standard valuation or proper valuation. So I think that I agree with you. That's a big impact and that's a big hit. I see that as our negligence for not doing this sooner and not doing well, it right, more frequently. They just, so, need a, and a, they just need a heads up. Well, right, and I, and I think we'll accomplish that. But yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if we're able to mitigate that that impact. I think it's it's a result of waiting for as long as we have. And I think the flip side of that is going to be on the residential side as well. The longer we wait to do that, that greater that inequity is going to be, and the harder it's going to be for the residents to absorb any kind of change in valuation. So I think it is kind of incumbent on us to, to, to take the information, move it forward, um, and do outreach properly, communicate that properly, but make sure that you know prompt action is taken. If we keep kicking this down the road, it's just going to get harder and harder and harder for people to absorb that increase when it finally comes. Um, Councilor? Uh, Foley. Foley. Thank you. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, so I 200% support the fact that this needs to be done uh, on both sides, the residential and the commercial. I do wish we had budgeted for it. Um, I do think in this particular case it's the right way to start and it's going to pay for itself. Um, so I'm comfortable going forward, but I, I think looking at it from a, a kind of a larger or a, a more aerial view, I hope that Again, like anything you do, you learn and you get better at it. So uh, what are the right trigger points in which we would say, do we do this every five years and how do we phase it out differently? I was talking with a former counselor up in Bangor who uh, said on the residential side they you know, mapped out the town and so that they could handle it internally rather than having to pay out. And they you know, did it in phases, so you know, over three years the whole town was done. So there are some other creative ways of, of looking at that, and those might come have pros and cons, um, but I think more frequency, I think, as Councillor Chiazzo said, perhaps is one of the solutions. Um, and we can start, I'm glad to hear that we're going to budget this for next year, so it will be in the budget to do the, proper, the, the residential end. Um, but we should start that outreach now as well, so always getting ahead of the communication way <coughs> instead of trying to catch up with it. That's it. And we did partially budget for this uh, in years past, which is why it's only $77,000. So that would be incorrect to say that we haven't. And the circumstances that <coughs> surrounded the uh, period since the defeat uh, in referendum in 2014 have been uh, 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 have justified not going forward until we had stability within our assessing department, which we now have. So. Uh, I think the, it would be uh, error to say that we had been remiss in doing this. We've made an effort in recent years. It was turned down. We've had instability in the assessing department, and you really don't want to have that circumstance uh, exist. And we've corrected that, and now <coughs> we have the opportunity to do it. So, Councilor David. Um, three points. Uh, first is I wanted to mention that in the Finance Committee, we did um, suggest, and I think um, I, pretty certain that Tom heard that as part of our analysis for this year's budget is that we do want to look at a um, 
analysis that takes where we are today without the uh, assessment or the new assessments and then look at the impact side by each so that there is clear transparency about what the actual increase is. So I, we're not trying to hide anything, but the fact is that we need to do that piece. And that's what I heard coming out of it. And we all three were in agreement that we wanted to look at that analysis. Second is that optics is sometimes over amplified by the words that we choose. And I think that it's also about the information that we share. The reason why it went to the voters last night wasn't about whether or not we needed to do evaluation. It was whether or not we were going to fund it by a bond. That is the only reason why it had to go to the voters. And the voters said that they did not want to bond it. Why they didn't want us to bond it is speculative because I did not speak to every single person, and nobody has, about why they voted no. Probably a good assumption is that no one wants their taxes to go up, but um, nobody does, no matter what they live in um, or where they work. Um, the, the piece here is that we have the cash to take care of it. Um, and if our concern is about um, solutions that need to go to the people in order to be transparent, um, I just have to throw this in. I hope that maybe as soon as the um, settlement regarding the tax appeal, if their settlement comes before us, maybe that should go to the voters given its size and ask if they can approve that for us. <laughs> Other uh, comments? Peter. Yeah, yeah, I just want to. Just a point of clarity, we haven't funded or budgeted the assessment in the past, but we did put money aside as for the software for it. So it's Which is slight. part of the package. Yeah, yeah but, it's, but it's, we bought the software a couple of years ago, to, or we it's set aside budget. funds it's for the software. Exactly. The software. Correct. Not, not Which is part assessment. of the cost of this project. Want to be clear. Other comments? I think Councillor Hayes made some, some excellent points about uh, some of the concerns of, with this, but I think for, in my mind it comes down to the fairness issue that, that the um, – um, that we have the opportunity to improve the equity over who, how much taxes everybody in town pays. Um, and so the, um, you know, and as long as we follow this up with the residential revaluation, mm -hmm. we're, we're essentially saying to the uh, folks that are impacted by this this year that, you know, you, we're making up for years past, but next year everybody's going to be uh, revalu revalued and therefore everyone will be, will be paying their fair share based on the assessment of their home so that the, uh, when we divide the municipal budget amongst all of us, it's being paid equally. Other comments? I, I think this is keeping faith with uh, all taxpayers. Uh, this is a fair, fairness and equity issue uh, in which uh, we have a substantial dis disparity uh, between commercial and industrial values and residential values. And the sooner we can correct it, given how substantial this disparity is, uh, the more appropriate uh, uh, our response is. So uh, with that, I'll ask all in favor. Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, order number 18-009, act on the request and support of a community development block application on behalf of Habitat for Humanity. They are seeking uh, an $18,000 CDBG funding to support uh, final infrastructure improvements, uh, i.e. final coat of paving at the Carpenter Court uh, subdivision. And I'd ask the planning director to introduce this matter for us. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you just noted, uh, this is a request really from Habitat for Humanity for the CDBG funding, which is Community Development Block Grant funding. Uh, Scarborough is a participating community in the Cumberland County uh, Block Grant funding source, which is ultimately <coughs> through HUD. It's a federal grant source. Um, sort of long just a, a bit of background on that. Um, but essentially the request is the program requires that the, the participating municipalities be the applicant. Um, and so in this case, um, Habitat for Humanity approached the town. Uh, I spoke with the town manager. We didn't have any particular grant applications we were putting together. Um, and there's, there's uh, pretty finite or, or discrete elements to which you can apply for funding. Um, and it's really around uh, meeting low, moderate income families and households in discrete ways. And this project um, 
they requested that we be really the host for their application. So the town's not being asked to do anything other than support the grant <coughs> application. There will be a little bit of administrative work from my department, um, but it's not going to be a heavy lift. Uh, fortunately, the folks at Cumberland County have a good staff that help with a lot of the, um, the, the federal checklists that need to be done. Um, so there will be that bit of participation, but there's no actual monetary request to the town. Again, we're being asked to sort of be the host, if you will. And then just a little background on the actual project itself. This is a project for which the town was the active participant uh, for two CDBG grants. One was a planning grant around uh, developing the concept for the affordable housing. Where this pro um, project is being developed is off Broad Turn Road, uh, just as you come towards the Turnpike. It was a town-owned piece of land that the town had purchased from the Turnpike Authority with the idea of, at some point, having an affordable housing project there. So we got one grant for the planning, and then uh, in subsequent years, we went back and received a secondary grant uh, for actual infrastructure improvements, and that was to run the public sewer line uh, from a point on Broad Turn Road up to a point at the access uh, to this uh, development. Um, so those were actual active grants that we were really sort of the leads of. Here, again, um, Habitat for Humanity being who they are, uh, always trying to sort of um, uh, you know, look for other funding sources to benefit their um, their residents are requesting that we host the application. So hopefully that answers questions as we go. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Chase? Thank you, Jay. Uh, public, uh, any member of the public wishing to address this, please approach the podium. And we'll close the public, uh, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion? So I, I just want to take That's the opportunity. Right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that I, I love this project. Uh, I love the model, um, and uh, uh, I'm wholly supportive. Other comments? <clears throat> Council Katerina. I'm also a big fan of uh, Habitat for Humanity. I think what they do is awesome, and the fact that they're doing this project in Scarborough is more than awesome, so I would support this also. Other comments? Uh, uh, Habitat for Humanities makes a tremendous contribution uh, in our town and elsewhere. Uh, I think the support that we feel for their efforts uh, 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 should uh, hopefully allow the town manager to carry on discussions with Habitat for Humanity to see if we can uh, develop other projects that would uh, support the mission of affordable housing. And I think I probably could speak for all of us in that regard. Uh, Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, order 18-010, act on the request from the Scarborough Housing Alliance to utilize funds from the Affordable Housing Initiative Fund in the amount of $100,000 toward the Betsy Commons uh, II uh, uh, project and authorize the town manager to sign any and all documents related to this order. Uh, I'm going to ask the housing, Scarborough Housing Alliance uh, Chair uh, uh, Marge DeSanctis to introduce this matter for us. Thank you. So you've saved the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> um, I came before the council back in October, early October, I think the 4th, and outlined our plans of the Scarborough Housing Alliance. Um, we were going to prepare an RFP, but at that time we also talked about carving out Avesta and Bessie Commons, Avesta Southgate project and Bessie Commons, because those two projects were already in process. We have completed the RFP. We're hoping, I think you have a copy of it. I think everyone okay. received a copy. You didn't get your copy? At the end. At the end. Okay, never mind. You will get a copy. Anyway, <laughs> we've finished our RFP and we're hoping to have that out tomorrow, Monday, whatever, you know, ASAP. But meanwhile, we had carved out these other two projects. Um, the Bessie Commons um, expansion, part two, will receive one extra point on the main housing um, uh, process. And sometimes one point can make the difference between getting approved and not getting approved. And we're hoping that by giving them this $100,000 out of our in lieu fund 
um, you know, where we get uh, the collected of these in lieu fees. We're hoping that giving them the $100,000 grant, which gives them a point, will be enough to bump them up in, pro in the process and get approved by the Maine State Housing Program. So um, that's really the goal, uh, to get, we need the senior housing. Uh, they've got a waiting list that's, um, I'm trying to remember, I didn't write it down. Something like three years. Something like three years, yeah. Um, I was going to say 30-something months. But anyway, around three years waiting list to get into Bessie Commons. So we clearly have a need for this Bessie Commons uh, expansion. And the 100000 is out of our fund, and our fund currently has $380,000 <coughs> in it. Um, so we get a big bang for this 100000 uh, if we're going to get, I think it's 40-something units um, from the second Bessie Commons uh, program. So that's part of the scoring system. It, has potential to make them more successful, and that's why we ask for um, your approval on dispensing the $100,000 grant. We wouldn't actually dispense it. I'll take that back and reward it. Approving the $100,000 grant. We would only dispense it if they were approved by the Main State Housing and got the award, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we ask your approval to confirm the $100,000 grant. Um, and then we're also going to be addressing very shortly on our next agenda, Avesta has also come back to us with some uh, funding uh, requests for unforeseen environmental uh, issues. So uh, we'll address that soon. But right now we just have the 100000 for Bessie, and those were the two projects we had carved out. Any questions? Questions for March. Katie. Do you have any sense of uh, what that project could do for that waiting list? I mean, would they essentially? Well, if it's 40-something units, um, three years. Just curious. It probably so, brings it I mean, down. I'm Go sure ahead, Will. So you know, I would, I would say that the 40 will fill immediately, right. and then there will likely be a three-year wait list for it. Still. There's oh, an yeah. insatiable need for it. Yeah, I was going to say it might, it might shorten it to two years. Yeah. But not, not um, it's not it's not mm -hmm. going to make it go away yeah. if that's what you're thinking. No, no, no. I just I didn't no, know it, how it, they it, can, it no. might shorten it in the interim, but yeah. um, there's there's a significant need for senior housing. That's right. If I could, and this might not be necessarily for Marjorie, maybe it's for the for the town manager. Do we foresee um, projects coming online that will be doing the inlu fees to replenish that fund, or are we? Leaning, I mean, I know it's hard to predict, but. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm wondering. Well, we don't have the whole amount from Gateway yet. Right, right. And what do we anticipate that? So it's 700000 Okay, okay. And, and their pace of development suggests that we'll see that within the next 12 months. Okay, all right. Right. So to right answer, now we have 308. To answer your fundamental question, it seems increasingly <coughs> clear to me that it's difficult for developers to actually physically provide affordable units for all sorts of reasons, unless that's the business they're in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and given our current in lieu uh, structure and fee amount, that appears to be the cheapest and easiest option. So I, I think that will continue to likely be the one they favor. And um, does that apply to all zones in town? No, no, this is for the RFP that's going out. No, no, for the no, yeah, no I, know, I know that. No, I'm talking about the ability to pay in lieu fees. Is that zone predicated or is that? Um, yeah. My concern is more the, you know, obviously the discussion we had at workshop. There's a 10% requirement there. Is that a hard physical requirement or is that an opportunity also for in lieu fees? Uh, I believe they could satisfy with in lieu fee as well. Okay. Okay. Crossroads, you mean? Yes. 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 Yeah. But, but, yeah. um, with the RFP that you're going to get, um, that's for the growth areas. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. No, I was, I was thinking about re how we're going to keep the fund balance in there or whether we're going to drain it down. I know. Yeah. yeah. It's, they, it's delightful that we have some funds that we can actually we use should. to encourage these affordable housing projects. And mm -hmm. um, and so not having gotten the whole 700000 uh, we had about 200000 before the gateway started even coming in. So. It has been exceedingly difficult to raise funds for this affordable <coughs> housing fund. <clears throat> and we have placed uh, conditions on zoning to try to create it. There are in lieu fees that have paid, but the, the pace of increase in the fund has been very slow. Uh, applaud the council's effort last year to approve the Gateway Commons 
contract zone amendment, which through rapid action on the part of the council to get that through, has allowed that project to go forward, and that is $700,000 was negotiated uh, through some good arm twisting. Uh, a very good outcome for this community, and, uh, and that's going to provide the kinds of funds that we're talking about for the RFP uh, and for these other projects. Thank you, Marge. Oh. Peter. It's sort of on topic, sort of not, but in, in lieu of that, just kind of a parking lot. I think when we talked about this, though, we talked about is Ian Lou fees at the right level as we compared it to other places in, in the market? I don't know where that sits in, in the scope, but that's something based on the conversation we just had that <coughs> it's difficult getting it. We may want to think about if the fee is the right amount. I'm going to let Will answer. Oh, I was going to say uh, ap active topic of discussion in, in the committee. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is, it, is it the right amount? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anything Marge. Uh, are there members of the public who would like to speak to this issue? None. Close that. I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Chris. Uh, yeah, I I'm obviously fully support the program. I think it, I I'm just wondering if this is the future of the way we talk about public-private partnerships. Of, you know, we make that requirement. If there's difficulty meeting that physical requirement, is this the model of the future, where we where we have to do specialized investment for specific Avesto or you know or or low-income housing? And um, if that's you know if, if if that's the model, then you know so be it. I just you know, I, I'd like to I'd like to have that discussion at some point when we talk about the zoning. If we can expect more, I I, I think we've discussed kind of openly. It's always better to have that inclusionary in the neighborhood or in the development itself rather than segregated out. Um, that's the that's the optimal I think. Um, but in in lieu of that, no pun intended, then we have to do a separate facility. Then I guess we have to decide if that's the mechanism we want to move forward with. And I, and I think the, the question is the town council, but really the town manager can show the real leadership for us to find the best ways, because they're not all the same, as we've seen. Right. Uh, all different ways of affordable housing coming forward. Uh, and I, I think that the leadership of the town manager is invaluable in this setting. I'd just like to comment on that, if I could. We have we have seen some uh, private developers build some affordable housing mm -hmm. units uh, in exchange for bonus density. Um, uh, Eastern Village, um, uh, Mr. Risbera mentioned he, they they built some up on Muzzy Road as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're seeing some, uh, but but certainly some some we have seen some developers choose <coughs> to pay the Lou fee instead. Uh, I think um, also uh, Mr. Chamberlain down in. Um, Dunstan Crossing is also building affordable units. Yeah, and I, I'm not again. I'm not suggesting that we burden them too extensively. But if our goal is to have that inclusionary in the development, that would go to the fee structure itself to say maybe we make gotcha. that not as like attractive. Uh, you know, yeah. <coughs> I don't want to. You don't want to overburden them and have the project not move forward. But yeah. that's, just that's, to be clear, both Eastman yeah. Village and Dunstan Crossing have requirements. They've not yet produced any units, so I, I think they're still. <laughs> No, there's still Touché. legitimate concerns as to how they actually do it. How they're right, going right, to do right, it. Right. Yeah. Other mm -hmm. comments, discussion? Mm -hmm. I, I just want to point out the, the cost per unit here. Uh, from our perspective, our investment would be about $2,500 per uh, unit. Um, these are um, one bedroom, 55-plus uh, um, units, and it's, it's also beyond our uh, level of uh, our definition of affordability, where we say 80% uh, of AMI. Uh, this serves a 60% AMI population and lower uh, of um, 55 plus. So I, I think it's uh, terrific. Um, I also think that um, that uh, the, the leveraging that we talked about with that in Luffy is is uh, what we're seeing here. I'm not sure that we'll we'll always get such a bargain, if you will. This is a pretty good good deal, and I think we should support it. Good. Other comments. Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Unanimous. Uh, <clears throat> uh, order number 18-011, uh, act on the request to approve the 2018 Town Council goals, and I'll ask the Town Manager to introduce us. Yes, uh, I've done my best. I hadn't heard feedback, so I assume we <laughs> captured at least the essence of your consensus, but uh, this is the product of uh, 
really the work you did with the consultants. Um, we didn't task them specifically with doing goal, goals work, but they talked to you individually through the questionnaire, um, synthesized some of those comments, uh, kind of put those back to you, and they were the subject and kind of the basis for a workshop last month on the matter. And uh, in substance, these <coughs> pretty much remained um, as they were originally presented. We did kind of fine tune them, and I hopefully captured all those fine tunings, if you will. So as is the practice, I, I would always recommend that you formally adopt these so we can um, actually have something to point to as the year goes on. Uh, members of the public interested in speaking to this uh, order, please approach the podium. Uh, see none, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, discussion. Uh, Councilor Gatorino. Well, I sent you some feedback. What are you talking about? You didn't hear <laughs> Oh, I, did, I ignored that. Oh, <laughs> like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's not no go back there. Bench That's right against here. our goal, isn't it? That would, <laughs> That's <laughs> against our goal. That was not so. We have no um, and and I, I read through these slides, and of course, being <laughs> the chair of communications, which got canceled today because of this, but that's okay. I just the community relations one jumped out at me because that's one I've been most involved with. Um, I'm not asking for any changes on these goals per se, but I would I would ask that we do some accountability factors with it because uh, you, you make all these statements, but there's no way to measure them. There's no way to, it's like, okay, you know, what are we doing? Like, for example, uh, community relations says continue to build trust with constituents, and I changed that to be continue ongoing written communications programs, Facebook, email, newsletter, and the leader column. They cover varied communications issues and programs, just as an example. And the second one, I said, continue to provide opportunities for small neighborhood-based conversations around such, uh, such subjects as the budget. Um, this year, the plans are listen to learn and budget dialogues. Uh, and then I had encourage counselors to respond in a timely and respectful fashion to constituent emails. And then I also had encourage constituents to engage respectfully with the town council, town staff, and community at large. So that was just, those were the changes I made to community relations, but I'm fine with leaving it like this, but I mean, that's me. And for, forgive me, I was flipped with my response. Oh, so that's I, okay. I, I did receive them, I considered them, but this was a consensus driven process. I didn't feel mm -hmm. comfortable taking comments of one and putting them in front of you, so. And uh, if, if it makes sense, <clears throat> I would like to take a crack at an action item uh, annotation of this product uh, so that we actually achieve what uh, Council Caterina is talking about, as have clear, uh, a clear understanding of what would make us be successful in addressing each of these items. It may not be a complete set success, it, uh, but I would welcome, uh, I'll circulate something in the days ahead and then uh, ask each of you to reflect on it and add your own and comments back on anything that I might suggest. And we'll then bring it back again for things that we want to actually try to accomplish to achieve these goals. Comments? Yeah. Would you do that in the workshop type thing? Like yeah, I definitely could do it on a workshop. <clears throat> Allow for a good discussion. I think workshop's a good suggestion. Other comments? Just I want to, it's not recited here, but as I recall, there was pretty clear understanding, and it might have been captured in some of the work with the consultant, but to, to rely on committees to do work. Yeah. So it's certainly my intention to share these goals with my staff and with committee chairs, yeah. and to the extent that they can help advance these and <coughs> inform your action plan, mm -hmm. I'll encourage them to do so. Yeah. When I started the action plan I, uh, with finance, I said, I think the planning process that is recommended by the goal uh, needs to be undertaken by the Finance Committee uh, and they need to report back to us because I know they have been working on this. Uh, but uh, we need to actually put it before us and start to say, yeah, these are things that we're actually going to do. <coughs> Other comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you, unanimous. Uh, Non-action items, none uh, uh, standing in special committee reports and liaison reports. Start down with Chris. 
Uh, I actually have none uh, this cycle. Between snow cancellations and traveling, I, I have no committee reports or uh, and sickness, I might add. Uh, no committee reports or liaison reports. Peter. Um, I report out on finance. I think we covered that. So I'm good. Chief Wright. Um, May Municipal, we had one meeting where we went to Augusta and we talked about various bills. There's not a whole lot going on in Augusta because they're all busy running for governor. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I will. They, we're going to continue to monitor. We don't have to go back to Augusta, so that was interesting. And I have talked to Tony about a couple of things that she had asked me about. Uh, communications will be pushed off. I hate to do this, but till March. Eighth, I think, if I've got the right date. <laughs> These guys are looking at me like, you sure you got the right date, Jim? And then ordinance, we don't have anything. We will have, obviously, after speaking to uh, uh, the Rizbaras and the issues, um, but that will be March 15th. But that's it for me. On Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the Eastern Trail Alliance met and um, they continue to celebrate uh, the main Department of Transportation's mm -hmm. commitment to helping them close the gap yes. on the uh, Eastern Trail. However, we will also want to implore upon people that we're not done yet. So even though they've committed to filling the gap, there's still uh, a lot of fundraising efforts that are going to continue to go on because costs are inevitably going to be more than uh, originally uh, budgeted and, and anticipated. So in that uh, light, we have some upcoming events to put on your calendar. This one no one wants to miss. It's going to be the hottest ticket in town, <coughs> April 7th, the Taste of the Town. It's going to be held at Camp Ketcha. I'm not positive on ticket prices yet, um, but the time pilots will be there, so it's an opportunity to go out dancing with your friends and neighbors. Um, some great silent auction items if there are businesses out there who would like to donate to the cause and uh, via silent auction items, please get in touch with somebody, myself or someone else from the committee. Um, and there'll be more to come on that event. There's also a few spring runs planned, the annual uh, John Andrews Memorial 5K, uh, which is done in partnership with O'Reilly's Cure, will be on May 19th. That is also, uh, those funds will also go to the Eastern Trail Alliance as well. So sign up, get out there, get active, move. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, so the uh, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee met last night um, at the meeting. Um, we discussed a number of issues, including our, our council, our, excuse me, our chairman, um, Craig Friedrich, uh, drafted a letter of support in favor of the, um, uh, the plan before the planning board for the, um, the property at 450 uh, County Road, which mm -hmm. is the... Um, which is the uh, the church that's on the corner of Broad oh, yeah. Broad uh, the Broad Turn Broad Turn and Kennedy Broad Turn Broad Turn yeah uh, and um, I, I spoke about it actually at the last meeting I believe Post um, names. but that's going to be passed to the planning board um, we also spent a lot of time um, our uh, one of our members um, Jessica Holbrook um, has been going through all of the uh, 48 properties that are on our list uh, and um, and the reason is that. Uh, uh, Jay uh, Chase uh, came to us a while ago and said, hey, I, when somebody comes to me with a project for one of these uh, properties, I don't really have the context for what it is that you guys really care about. All I know is that it's on the list and I can't tell them why. And so what we're hoping to do is to be able to provide them with documentation about what is historically significant about each of these properties um, so that um, the planning department will be better informed. Um, and uh, she's been doing some great work. Uh, it's been really somewhat challenging to kind of marry up the, uh, the lot number with the mm -hmm. property on a map and then figure out what, it, what exactly what it is. But, um, but it's, uh, it's good work and it continues and um, uh, we're all supportive of it. We also had made reference to, um, excuse me, moving on, Affordable Housing, uh, Scarborough Housing Alliance also met uh, since our last meeting um, and we finalized our RFP. Um, so as alluded to earlier, I'm going to pass these out if you can pass them down. I printed six copies, I promise you, but I only have five copies. Okay. <laughs> we, know uh, who, we know who you like and don't like. That's because you didn't vote for my amendment. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so, um, at, as uh, Marge alluded to, it, in October we came to forward with a plan, um, which was um, uh, to put out an, an RFP, and, and so 
the account balance after uh, right now is at um, uh, 300,000. That's with a something just north of uh, we we think it's um, roughly a hundred thousand dollars so far that Divine has contributed. Um, but the idea behind this is that um, we've outlined. Um, what it is really that we're that we're trying to drive we've defined affordable housing uh, we've outlined our scoring criteria we've asked for what we'd like to see in in the rfp but we're basically asking for a plan um, uh, plans to be submitted uh, this summer um, so that we can then take a look and make a recommendation to this board and see if there are any anything that we would want to uh, also um, move forward um, so this really is just for your information to say that, hey, we kind of did what we said we were going to do. We're intending to release this on Friday. Um, if you have any concerns about it, let me know. Thank you. John. Thank you. Uh, for the, uh, the appointments and negotiation committee met on Monday, and um, I would like to um, post uh, for your information for the, or an action item at our next meeting, uh, the reappointments, the reappointments um, and new appointments um, that we are recommending to you. Um, for the Board of Assessment Review, we're recommending to reappoint Alan Peoples and Christopher Herrick with terms to expire in 2020, um, to move Hugh O'Shea from first alternate to full voting member with a term to expire in 2018, and to move Marjorie DeSanctis from second alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2019. That leaves two vacancies. Coastal Waters and Harbor Advisory Committee to move Michael Lynch from first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2018 to appoint Steve DeCosta as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020. That leaves three vacancies. To reappoint Leroy Crockett as a full voting member with a term to expire in, oh, sorry, Community Services and Rec Advisory Committee is to reappoint Leroy Crockett as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020. To move Liam Somers from first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2019 and to appoint Tim Lindsay as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2020. There are no vacancies. Conservation Commission to reappoint Ben Keller and Suzanne, um, if I pronounce that right, Susan Nixon. Nixon, as a full voting member um, with a term to expire for both of them in 2020, and to reappoint Steve DeCrosta as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020, leaving no vacancies. For the Energy Committee to reappoint Anton Boder and Judy Roy as full voting members with terms to expire in 2020, leaving no vacancies. For the Housing Alliance to reappoint Marjorie DeSanctis and Kimberly Fowler as full voting members with terms to expire in 2020. And to appoint Hugh O'Shea as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2018, leaving no vacancies. For the Parks and, Re Parks and Conservation Land Board to reappoint Sean Flaherty, Richard Murphy, and Jane Palmer as full voting members with terms to expire in 2020, leaving no vacancies. For the Personnel Appeals Board to reappoint Jennifer Beatty as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020, to move Emily Ward from first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020, and to move Art Dillon from a second alternate to a first alternate position with a current term to expire in 2019 leaving only one vacancy. For the Pest Management Advisory Board, recommendation is to appoint Richard Sullivan as the dedicated arborist and horticulturalist with a term to expire in 2020, to appoint Tim Lindsay as the community services representative with a term to expire in 2020, and to appoint Rita Brenton as a member at large to fill a term to expire in 2018, leaving no vacancies. For the Planning Board, to reappoint Roger Beely as a full voting member with terms to expire in 2020, also to reappoint Richard Dupere, Dupere? Yeah, I think that's right. um, as a second alternate with a term to expire in 2020, leaving no vacancies. For the Senior Advisory Board to reappoint Donna, Mar Donna Marie Collins and Kenneth Simons as full voting members with terms to expire in 2020, to move Jane Palmer from first alternate to full voting member with a current term to expire in 2019, and to appoint Hugh O'Shea as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020, and to appoint Carol Spencer as a first alternate to fill a term to expire in 2018, leaving one vacancy. For the Selfish Conservation Commission, we recommend that you reappoint Will Hamill and move him from first alternate to a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020, to appoint Andy Blanchard as a full voting member with a term to expire also in 2020, and to appoint Nate Orff as a first alternate with a term to expire in 2020, leaving no vacancies. And for the Zoning Board of Appeals to reappoint Mark Maroon and Rick Lazell as full voting, voting members with terms to expire in 2020, leaving one vacancy. 
Um, there is one additional committee that's not on here with no appointments, but I did want to at least mention uh, we have the cable television board and we have seven vacancies, um, which I am looking for anyone interested, um, especially with the new technology we have in and an opportunity to really use a great resource. So there are seven vacancies on that board. Could, could Councillor elaborate how many positions are on that board total? I believe there's seven. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, and then the, the um, so I, that's in the, not a formal motion, but that will be posted. I will not read this again for the record because it will be entered into the record tonight. Thank you. No uh -huh. actions necessary, but those things Correct. will be posted. Yeah. Um, and um, in that process, I do want to mention, um, if you go through the, t you probably, if you listen closely or if you go through the text, I want to say thank you. There are so many people that are volunteering in this community and many people are volunteering twice, if not three times on different committees. So um, they give a, a pretty stellar level of uh, input and I think it's um, incredible that they are uh, part of that. Um, and then I did want to mention, oh, um, the committee also had a very long conversation around, um, particularly around, um, um, what's the word, communications with our committees, um, because we do have the all the summit, you know, the all board summit, is, which is utilized in one area. But one of the requirements that is in our ordinance or in our policy is that each of our committees um, are supposed to submit an annual report, and we're going to work through the chair of the council, um, myself and him, um, to uh, reach out to them and come up with a nice template that's very easy to use, something very similar to what um, our town staff use for our annual report. Um, that can be uh, not too lengthy but succinct and informative so that we can include that as part of the annual report uh, so that they can see what they're doing because some of those committees are doing incredible, incredible work. Um, and I know the cable TV, uh, <laughs> cable television committee is going to uh, do stellar work this year, but um, <coughs> that was a big uh, part of that. And the last piece is that um, the committee has um, also, because we're now doing the, what we call negotiations, is that um, we made a commitment last year and just getting to it this year in which we're going to look at the town manager's evaluation process um, from a um, context perspective. You know, is, is the manager's evaluation form uh, appropriate in today's environment because it's been many years since that was implemented? Um, is it the right tool? Um, as well as do a compensation analysis to see where we are as a community in the competitive market of town managers. Um, and then uh, to kind of um, move that forward because um, contract periods uh, go by really quickly. I think we're already in our second year uh, of the new contract, so we have some work to get done with that, and we're moving forward. Um, that's our big goal for this year, one of our big goals. And um, I have no other committee reports. To Thank you. <coughs> Town manager's report. Yes, a few quick items. Uh, public safety building update. It's been very busy. We've... Uh, successfully worked through a process to select a construction manager. This is the firm that will we're bringing them on during uh, the design phase. So it's really important that they'll be part of the design phase, their whole team, along with our, <coughs> our architect and consulting team, uh, and all the way through construction, they'll actually build it as well. I'm pleased to announce that Landry French Construction, a Scarborough-based uh, company, uh, was awarded that construction manager position. Uh, very pleased to have that local com uh, component. Um, for me, one of the, the really intriguing parts of their team, not only are they based in Scarborough, but two of the key uh, team members uh, live within a quarter mile of the site, mm -hmm. uh, one on Sawyer Road and one in Quorum Road. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's just intriguing that they uh, really expressed great personal interest and commitment to the project, and I, I think we're going to be very pleased with that selection. Uh, also, we have gone through a process to select an owner's representative. This is someone who will re represent the town's interests. Uh, the architect, the builder, uh, all of them were on a team, but they all have their own interests. So it's very important that we have some technical eyes and support. And we're very pleased to bring them on, again, at the front end of this process, as opposed to um, after design, for instance. Uh, we've selected uh, Tom Perkins. He owns a company out of Turner, Maine. Very highly recommended. Um, and I should put a shout out to both Rocky Rosbera and Kevin Freeman, who have been incredible assets throughout this whole process. Uh, the sort of insight that they both brought to this evaluation uh, was was just something that uh, we didn't know we didn't know, and so uh, we're we're that much better for their involvement for sure. And I would remind the council and the public that both gentlemen, their companies could have potentially been on this project, but they chose at the front end to. Uh, remove themselves from the running and offer tremendous service to the community. 
Uh, we do have a kickoff meeting next Tuesday morning. This is to bring the team together for the first time. I don't expect there will be a lot of work uh, getting done there, but it's really important and exciting. I want to mention that Deb McDonough, Deb is someone who uh, many of you may have known, but she's been tireless in her work on the Energy Committee <coughs> and other uh, exploits. Uh, she's been nominated and will receive the Eco Excellence Award oh, this year awesome. through Eco Maine. And uh, there will be a presentation of that award on March 6th that um, certainly staff will be there to help celebrate. Also, I want to thank members of council who participated in our rating calls. We went through the fun task this week of meeting with at least by telephone with Moody's um, and also Standard & Poor's. This is uh, all um, uh, parts of our bond sale that's upcoming next week. And uh, we should hear tomorrow what, uh, what the ratings are. The expectation of our financial advisor is that we should maintain our ratings. Um, there's really not much more room to go up. So we're talking about very small changes at this point. Um, I think they went well. And again, I appreciate all of your involvement. Hopefully that was uh, enlightening for you. And lastly, uh, at your places this evening is the uh, financial audit. Uh, I've been working through the council chair and school board chair. Um, we need to do a joint presentation. Uh, the auditors are hired by <coughs> you, the elected officials, and so the presentation uh, from them needs to be to you, and we've done it jointly just to be efficient on time. Um, we're challenged with some dates just because we have workshops already booked in. Uh, the date that we're working on is March 1st. That's a regular school board evening. That's a Thursday. So if, if it wouldn't be too much of an imposition, we'd look to do a workshop at 6 p.m. that night and uh, then their meeting will follow at 7. So uh, I think we'll have further outreach, but that's the current thinking. Uh, and I should mention for the public uh, copies of the, uh, the audit, uh, along with the management letter and, and the like, are all available on our website if anyone wants to look at it. Uh, it does mean another night out uh, uh, for us, uh, but it's limited to an hour and it's 6 o'clock, so it seemed to me to be the most efficient way to do it. Uh, and we were otherwise restrained for uh, finding the time to do it. Uh, council member comments uh, start down with Sean. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to um, um, the owners of uh, Crossroads Development LLC, which is um, the three Rispero brothers, Mark, Billy, and, and um, Mark, Billy, and Rocky, um, as well as to um, Peter and um, Dick. Dick, Peter and Dick Misho. Um, I thought their presentation was um, absolutely uh, stellar. I think it's really nice to see how they're looking 40 years in advance and, and what the final outcome is going to be. And there's still going to be obviously a lot of questions and a lot of um, effort put into this. So um, I wish them luck and I think that we're going to um, see a, a very incredible plan when we get to the end of that. And so uh, I'm looking forward to the additional information that's going to be shared with, you know, shared with them or shared by them. And last, it's uh, this is more of a personal note, but I think that the citizens, when people come and make statements, um, they need and they make pretty uh, derogatory statements or uh, information shared that they need to be updated. So I can't remember the date, but um, um, everyone kind of remembers the unfortunate situation at my last council meeting as chair, which um, Mr. Doyle from Falmouth uh, had to be uh, escorted out. And then he came to a town council meeting afterwards and presented us with uh, what appeared to be a summons or a, a court case. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that I think it needs to be made clear to the public that that was not done in proper order. And so they, he has not, not suggesting it, I wanted him to move forward, but you know, a lot of people are asking, uh, at least ask me, so what's happening with this? Nothing's happening with it because it was, a, it was a false claim that was made and he never followed through with it. And I think the citizens need to know what the status of that is. In fact, uh, when he did go to court for that, um, the judge ended up, uh, and I don't know the legal terms, but um, basically stayed the case and pushed it out until like May or something because he irritated the judge basically um, based on the case. So people are, at, I see a lot of people and they're all asking because I think it's, uh, it's unique. It's unique. I'm trying to be polite about the word. So I just wanted to at least share it because I think that they need to know. Thank you. How's it rolling? Uh, so um, I'm going to be brief because uh, it's late um, and we've been here for a long time. Uh, but uh, the fuel rally is this weekend. Saturday. So it's on Saturday? Saturday. Saturday morning? Set from 10 to noon. 
Great. I was going to announce it. Well, I stole your thunder. But <laughs> actually, enjoyed it. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be brief as well. Winterfest is this weekend too, right? No. No, last it was last week. Oh, it was last. Oh, never mind. Hope you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Constant gathering. So yes, the fuel fun rally yes, is it. this. <laughs> is this Saturday from 10 to noon at Oak Hill Fire Station. Uh, it, this year, more than most recent years, it's so, so important to help us raise money to help our neighbors in need with, with uh, oil and, and propane. Um, it, uh, and uh, the prices are unbelievable for, uh, compared to what they have been, number one. Just all the cold weather that we've had. So it, it's uh, incumbent upon us who have the benefit of uh, warm homes and not having to struggle to pay bills to, I think, to help our neighbors. So you can pop by. They get food. Oh, my God, they get the best food that you can buy, baked goods and fun things for the kids to do and the police dogs do a little, you know, show what they are able to do their training thing and it's just a really nice family affair if you're really busy and you got too much to do with Hannaford's and whatever you're doing up on Route 1 we do have a drive through you can make a donation you just drive through one of the bays leave your check and move on but uh, anything that you can do to help I would be greatly appreciated thank you I'm awesome. Okay. <laughs> So um, I do want to thank uh, the town manager for um, giving us the opportunity to sit on the bond call. Um, I've been doing this for between school and finance now for seven years, and you always learn something. And I was um, very impressed with staff and our consultants. Um, those are pretty rigorous, um, and they know what they're doing, so they hone in on your weaknesses. So regardless of, uh, as a salesperson, I always appreciated the art of the of the gab, if you will, uh, they tend to blow right through that <laughs> and say, uh, "What about this? What's your plan to address it? And um, you know, how are we going to? How are you going to hold yourself accountable to it?" So, definitely a good exercise for 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 me to observe. I know I know Peter listened in and and turned on was there too, but certainly an eye-opening experience. And I want to commend staff and and our, our bond council. They they did a stellar job, stellar job. Um, also had the opportunity. Um, I think it was last weekend now to attend the ribbon cutting ceremony at Camp Ketcha for their um, solar initiative that they did with UNE. It was kind of a nonprofit project. Um, and I won't give you a lot of details about it because um, through uh, Chairman Donovan, we've invited Tom Doherty, the, um, the, 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 the executive director for Camp Ketcha, to come and give us a little um, speech, a little five minute. Um, kind of uh, explanation of what happened. Uh, great project, um, great turnout, and I, I think you'll be pleased at all the very dynamic things that are going on in town, um, and this is certainly one of them. So I'm looking forward to having him come in next week, uh, or excuse me, next council meeting, um, to, to just give us an update of where they're at and, and, and what they did, so. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, too, attended the uh, bond uh, conference call. If you like bonds, very exciting. I personally got a good, I needed the sleep. So <laughs> I, uh, I thought this was a good opportunity to get some. Uh, and, and let me just say, Deb McDonough could not be more deserving of this award. She is a wonderful contributor, served for years on the energy committee with her, and she is a dynamo. Uh, and so uh, uh, congratulations to Deb. Uh, Take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Second. In favor. We are adjourned. I'll make the motion and vote no. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank